Good morning, everyone. We're gonna start our first ever uh, OMMA Grow Town Hall. This is going to be a little bit similar in the beginning to the town halls we had yesterday, dispensary and patient town halls. Uh, what will be different is the question and answer portion that will be very specific to Grows. That's who we have in the audience and that's who we're gonna hear from. I'm Adria Berry, I'm the executive director of the OMMA. Thanks for being here, thanks for showing up. Uh, we had quite a few registrants and we had, uh, I believe hundreds of submissions of questions, comments. I read through all of those, our staff read through all of those. We have OMA staff here, we have a few over here, and the first couple of rows here, we have some OMA staff. They are here as eyes and ears, they're taking notes, they're taking in everything that they hear <clears throat> so that we can go back and debrief and take back action items to the um, staff and figure out what we need to do to make some changes based on what we hear today and yesterday. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. There are gonna be questions you guys ask that I can answer today, and there are gonna be some that I can't answer. We are taking notes. We have Gilbert here uh, today. Will you raise your hand, please, Gilbert? He's with OMA, and he, he's taking notes. He's also going to take down contact information from you so that he can follow up directly if there's something that we need to follow up with you directly on. So. I am going to take a drink so I can clear my throat and then I'm going to get started on the presentation. All right. I'm just gonna do a brief presentation. I don't wanna take much of the, your time because we do have a three hour time allotted. The majority of that time is gonna be spent with you coming up to this podium to do a question and answer or comment period. If you signed up outside, you will have a three minute uh, time period, which is kind of like how city councils do it. You'll have three minutes to stand up here and give your comments or questions. The intent is for us to hear from you, our licensees, or uh, maybe you're not a licensee, maybe you are a citizen of Oklahoma who chose to come and give us your feedback. You are also welcome here. Uh, we do read everything we receive. Uh, we receive, e receive lots of emails, phone calls, comments on social media. As you guys know, we, we, we read every single thing. Um, we take all of that back for feedback. But I wanna go through some things that have happened at OMA in the past uh, year in 2022, give you some highlights of what's going on internally so that you can uh, just be in the loop on what we're doing. First thing I wanna highlight is our transparency project. I have McGregor in the back with me today helping click on some links. So McGregor, let's do the transparency project. Perfect. All right. So. This is a dashboard that you will be able to find on the OMA homepage. <clears throat> and please just kind of go through it and show them what they will find on this. This is data that we've never had access to before and therefore none of you have had access either. So what I find interesting and informative for all of you is it shows exactly what's going on across our state. It informs hopefully some of your business decisions because it lets you know what's going on, um, kind of lets you know about the competition in your business um, environment. It lets you know how many plants are being grown across the state, top retail sales, harvest going on monthly, um, all of that. What's coming soon is uh, some flags that we're getting. We are going to have flags showing up on here that will inform our inspections. So our inspection team um, right now, we get this data and what we're doing is we're looking at uh, some outliers. We're looking at it and saying, okay, this specific uh, grower is sending product to waste every single harvest. That is a flag. We need to get out there and investigate. Things like that. They're gonna flag things like uh, um, when our the wet weight doesn't match up to what it should with the dry weight. 
So you'll start seeing our top flags and, and what those mean and what that means to you as legitimate business owners who are trying to make it in this competitive market. It lets you know that we are trying to identify people who are skirting the rules, who are trying to find loopholes. This is our way of utilizing the data that we have to find those loopholes. Thank you, McGregor. Can you go back to the slideshow? Thank you. You guys have access to this. It will soon be updated weekly. Right now it's updated monthly, I believe. Oh, it is weekly now, so that is a new thing. It's updated weekly. Um, we do have a 100% inspection rate from April 2021 to May 2022 for the first time in OMA history. And then, of course, you guys all know that there will be a state question vote on March 7th, 2022. State question 820 uh, uh, was set as a statewide vote to legalize recreational marijuana. I want to get out ahead of your questions on that and let you know that as a state agency director, I am not um, legally allowed to say much about that at all. I'm not allowed to advocate for or against a state question. Um, as a human being and an individual and a citizen of Oklahoma, I of course have an opinion. And as Adria Berry, I love sharing my opinion, but as the OMA director, I can't say much. Um, I can tell you that we will, um, we have to be prepared to implement if it passes. We, we, it puts, uh, 820 would put the recreational uh, program under our regulatory authority. So we would have no choice. It would be our mandate. We would put it under our, um, our program and we would regulate it as we do now. We would follow the letter of the law. So if you have not read the letter of the law, that's what you need to do. That's what I tell all my friends, my family, anybody I know. You have to read the state question before you vote on it. Don't read the gist. Don't just read the first page. Read the entire thing before you vote on it. And just big picture, let you know why we're here, why we're doing these town halls. We were uh, planning to do a conference and it was actually supposed to be yesterday and today. We've been, I've been out talking about it. I've been very proud of it. We've been doing a lot of planning towards it. We were unfortunately unable to pull that off with our, um, uh, with the mandate to become a standalone agency by November 1st. That is uh, very similar to divesting a business. So, um, taking one business and making it into two. That's what we've done over the past six months. And so now we are a standalone state agency, but during that time we were unable to um, plan a, a state agency conference at the same time. So we have a path forward now. We are planning the state agency conference. Um, we're planning to call it OMA Ed. Uh, because it's going to be an educational conference. We have some um, exciting things in the works. We have some listening tours scheduled, scheduled excuse me, around the state. We're planning those for the fall. And uh, lots of things coming up over the next year. But we wanted to kick off 2023 with these town halls so that you know that we are wanting to engage and get out and talk to you guys more, hear from you more in 2023. But this is just the first of many things to come in 2023. Yeah. licensing data. You guys see this hopefully on our um, social media monthly. You receive this in your emails. It's everywhere. But we do uh, highlight it just for you to have this information. You can look, excuse me, you can look this over. For businesses, we have 11,700 uh, business licensees still um, as of January 2023, January 11th. Our data team put it into kind of a heat map form. So you'll see that as far as dispensaries, this shows where dispensaries are located throughout the state of Oklahoma. Processors. And then the one that's probably most interesting to the people in this room, especially as you think of the competitive market that you are in. I hope you're ready though. I think you guys knew this. You see the numbers in black and white and you know the numbers are over 7,000, but this shows you what over 7,000 looks like, right? 
And 788 was written in a way that doesn't put a limit on the number of plants that any of these dots can grow. Is there no limit? So when we think about where we are in Oklahoma, why there's too much supply, I know that there are a lot of reasons people want to, you know, people want to blame a lot of people, other people or things, or <clears throat> you want to come up with a reason. I think there are a lot of reasons and we can talk about those, but a lot of it does come back to this. And I don't think that there's any, there's not a, there's not a lot of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, there's not a lot of um, utility in spending time if we're not going to talk about the market, if we're not going to talk about uh, the basics of supply and demand. So I hope that when we talk about, yes, there's a, an illicit market, there is. Yes, uh, being a regulated market does increase the cost of business. Those things do affect your bottom line. I hope we will still continue the conversation about supply and demand and just the basics around that concept. The 788 excise tax was written into uh, state question 788 that legalized the medical marijuana program. As you'll see on the graph, the dark red line is fiscal year 2023 and excise tax collection is lower than it's been in the prior couple of years. We're gonna go into how the budget is expended in a couple of slides later. If you were watching um, any of the Facebook Lives from yesterday, you probably already saw all of this. <clears throat> so this is what we are accountable and responsible for. This is the part that we are not accountable and responsible for, but we do make sure you have this information. Your city government and county government receive these funds. Uh, this is paid at the dispensary level, but is expended by your city and county governments. And you'll see similarly that the dark red line indicating fiscal year 23 is lower than the previous two years. And when we talk about the OMA budget, the way that it was set up in state question 788 and continued in statute is that the excise tax paid at the dispensary level goes to fund the regulatory body, which is OMA. We are the primary regulatory body, even though there are other regulatory bodies that touch the medical marijuana industry, such as the water board, the DEQ, tax commission. What were you saying, Katie? Fire Marshal, LP Gas Commission, Department of Labor, there are many. Um, but we are the primary regulatory body that was set up specifically to oversee licensure and compliance for the medical marijuana industry, as you guys know. So the excise tax goes to fund our agency first, and then excess goes to um, education and mental health. We also receive licensure, licensure fees <clears throat> Excuse me. So that would be commercial and patient licensure fees. Historically, we have always had excess. There has always been excess in our uh, revolving fund that is utilized by the legislature to fund um, things like education and mental health programs. So this graph shows you uh, the dark blue is the excise tax collection line or bar, excuse me. And then the lighter green is patient license collections. Darker green is commercial license collections. So the state runs on a fiscal year that runs from July 1 to June 30 every year. That's the state fiscal year. 
if you are paying, <clears throat> excuse me, paying attention to state government, you want to know that because that's how all of their um, budgets and contracts run. Everything runs on a state fiscal year from July to June. And everything that we put out will run on, on the same contract, or excuse me, same um, calendar uh, fiscal year. Calendar and fiscal are different. I'm sorry, it's early. Fiscal year. So for fiscal year 22, you'll see it's down from 21. 21 was the highest in history as far as collections are concerned in the medical marijuana industry. This slide is a little, yeah, we tried to work on it, but I will make sure, I'm just gonna say what is missing from this slide. I'm not sure why it's not showing up properly. Do what? I don't know why. Um, on my printout, it's proper. Yeah, we double checked, but um, okay. So the big dark green is, it should say personnel costs 49.5%. That is what our budget went to in the previous fiscal year. Uh, so fiscal year 22, we expended 29 million. I, thank you. And the lighter green that you'll see, the, the next large chunk is contracts, which is 39%. Contracts include QA Lab, <coughs> excuse me, seed to sale tracking, data analytics, licensing portal, license card printing, mail services, office space, and vehicle leases. And then we look at the darker blue, that is 7.9% for information technology, IT equipment, rental, computers, phones, telecom equipment, rental, data processing software, and IT equipment maintenance. The lighter blue is software, excuse me, supplies and equipment. And the very skinny orange, other 0.4% includes travel and other minor expenses. So that's like reimbursement for traveling um, all across Oklahoma to do inspections and um, all kinds of things across the state. <clears throat> all right, today is bill filing deadline at the legislature. I, um, what that means to you is there are thousands, am I being hyperbolic? Hundreds of bills being filed today? <clears throat> <laughs> Millions. Um, lots of bills being filed today. And in my previous world, obviously it's been a few years, my previous jobs, it was my job to read every single bill. And so I would read like till my, you know, I couldn't see straight. And um, now I get to only read bills that deal with medical marijuana or state government. And so it's kind of like a treat. But um, we are uh, looking for every single bill that deals with medical marijuana or state government, pulling those out and making sure we track them. And we put them on a website and I will show you uh, where that is. But it's on our website and we link it so you can always find that. But Ashley Crawl is our legislative liaison. And she will be out at the Capitol this session and along with our Chief of Staff, Barrett Brown, who works with legislators. Um, we are um, making sure to track all of this. The perspective that we can give legislators is that of a state agency. We can't speak for all 11,000 uh, licensees when it comes to opinions because you all have very different opinions. We can give them common sense um, policy um, stances, we can't really speak to any kind of political um, statements. I hope that makes sense and we can clarify more through your questions and comments. But uh, for example, yesterday there was a question about why uh, can't uh, licensees submit their license renewals 90 days prior since we get 90 days to process. And I think that that makes total sense. And that's something we could talk to the legislature about because it just really makes sense. Um, but on the other side, there are um, policy questions, uh, excuse me, uh, questions that not everyone in the industry agrees on that we would not be able to go out and advocate for. So I want to be clear that that is 
not the role of a state agency to go out and advocate um, for uh, things that the industry itself does not agree on. But we do track, we do give the legislature information on how bills that they are working on would affect the industry. We seek feedback from you guys on how it would affect you so we can let them know. But we also need your support to make sure you're letting them know that. Um, so it, um, make sure you are talking with your legislator or make sure you know that you have um, you have a voice out there, whether it's you or it's someone you know that you trust um, talking with the legislature on your behalf. They will begin a legislative session the first Monday in February and they will go through the last Friday in May. So during that time, it's a limited time period. After that, it's too late until the next one starts. So just always keep that in mind during that time period. You can't come in the first week of June and say, oh, wait, I didn't like the language in that bill. If it was already signed into law, you're, you're too late. Okay, unless you have money to pay a lawyer and sue over it, but that's a different story. All right, L rules and legislation. Ashley went through some of the bills that have already been filed, um, and I'll go through those in a minute, but she also pulled some of the information regarding bills from last session and bills that were included in our emergency rules that were filed on November 1st. We um, filed emergency rules November 1st to make sure that we had our own code, excuse me, our own section in the code. I'm having a hard time waking up this morning. Let me just drink some coffee. Okay. <clears throat> she just sent her. Title 442, there we are, <clears throat> we're there. Title 442, that's where you can find us now in the administrative code. It's exciting. I'm excited because we became a standalone agency, so we have our own section in the administrative code. With that, we uh, incorporated some legislation that passed last session. All right, so House Bill 3019, that's the bill that allow, um, allows transparent packaging and requires an exit package. Senate Bill 1367 dealt with diversion, diversion um, more on the, the patient side. Senate Bill 1737 uh, requiring signage, which I know is a hot topic in this room, and registration with ODAF. So those were passed by the legislature and then incorporated in our rules on November 1st. We then opened our permanent rulemaking process and opened it up for public comment November 15th to December 15th, and we had the highest turnout for public comment at the state capitol on December 15th that I think we've ever had. So it was really impressive. Thank you guys for all coming out. For, for those of you that came out to give public comment, we received comment through, um, oh, actually I have specifics. We received about 108 written comments and 21 verbal comments. So we are in the process, process of considering all of those comments. We are submitting the rule documents to the Oklahoma legislature after we go through every single comment that we've received. So once we um, consider every comment, it goes to the legislature during the legislative session, and it goes into this big omnibus bill that ends up in the governor's hands by the end of session. We have this rulemaking map on our website, and even though I've worked in this world for a while, I still utilize this <clears throat> because rulemaking is a, <clears throat> it's just really, really nuanced, and um, it's not always intuitive, I'll say that. So I utilize these graphics that our comms team put together myself pretty often. So proud that we can offer them to the public for use if you guys ever need these. And we can offer them to other state agencies. I think they utilize them too. So this is the website, or the, excuse me, the link to our website where you can find the list of all legislation. And McGregor, I'm gonna ask you to click it, please. Isn't that a cool name, you guys, McGregor?
So along with Barrett's face, you guys should all definitely click, click on that video. We have a list of bills that passed during the last, last legislative session. So you'll always be able to come here, find the bill language, see what's going on, see which bill authors are working with marijuana legislation, and you can get in direct contact with them. I'm here to tell you that legislators are just like us. They're real people, they're regular people, and they come from your parts of the state. They come from your neighborhoods. So you just pick up the phone and you call them or you email them and you say, I'm in the industry and I wanna tell you my story. They really do need to hear it, okay? <clears throat> Thank you, McGregor. All right, so here are some bills that are GROW focused that have already been filed for the 23, 2023 legislative session. Senate Bill 116 by Senator Bullard would prohibit commercial grow facilities within a thousand feet of a place of worship. Senate Bill 117 by Senator Bergstrom would require commercial grower applicants and licensees to acquire water use permits from the OWRB prior to engaging in commercial growing operations. And then Senate Bill 133 by Senator Bullard excludes marijuana production from ag sales tax exemptions. So you can see where the Senate, at least these senators, are um, what they're hearing from their constituents. And these three, well, Cinder Bergstrom is in northeast, far northeast Oklahoma. Cinder Bullard is in southeast Oklahoma. And if reading these makes you angry, okay, fine. But take a step, take a step, okay? Take your anger out of it, they're hearing from constituents for some for a reason. And you've got to approach them and say, okay, what's going on? I'm in the industry. I need to know what you're hearing. What can we do to work with you to help make this better? Okay? Because either they are only hearing horror stories about this industry, or they're only seeing horror stories and they need to hear different things. I can't fix that for y'all. And I'm here to tell you I can't fix that for y'all. No matter what I say or try or do at the Capitol. So the water usage issue is, is real in rural Oklahoma. The um, being a good neighbor issue in rural Oklahoma is real. So talking to your legislators and telling them real stories of real Oklahomans who are just trying to make it doing the right thing is going to be incredibly important moving forward, okay? All right. So here are some of the rule changes in our proposed permanent rules. So these are the ones that just went through that comment period, that open comment period, these are the ones that will go to the legislature once we have submitted them. They are not submitted yet. We're going through all comments. So please take a moment, either write down these sections, take a picture, do whatever you need to do to make sure you are aware of the upcoming changes that directly affect grows. These are all on our website, like this is all out there and these were all open, but this is, it's not out there like this on a slide for you to view. Ashley put this all together just this week for this specific town hall. Everybody ready? Okay. 
All right, I asked our lab department and the head of the lab department, Mr. Lee Rhodes, to put together a few slides to give an update on what's going on there because that is so incredibly important um, to everyone in the industry. And so I'm gonna give this update, but Lee is available also to, hi Naomi, to give an update um, at the end as well. So the lab department, as you guys know, is, um, has been under scrutiny just as far as the, the licensed labs. There are so many questions about why there are varying results coming from different labs, right? We know that. We hear it. We know it. Lee is a um, scientist. He has scientists on staff. And so what they've been doing this year is working to answer that question and figure, figure out why. So they've done a total of 18 inspections in 2022. They spend about three to four days on site at each inspection. And what they do at each inspection is um, a deep dive into every uh, piece of equipment, the SOPs, and they dig into every single corner of the location. And then they spend three to four weeks reviewing that data and every document. Uh, they do pre-licensure inspections. They've done two of those this year, and they are, um, they've are they worked on four investigations with three of them still ongoing, and one of those investigations resulted in a surrendered license. Three recalls have been done on marijuana and marijuana products based on the inspections and investigations done by the lab's team. And the referrals that come from the lab department, they go to places like our compliance department, our enforcement and investigations department, the Department of Agriculture, Oklahoma City Fire Marshal. Um, Lee works closely with um, other state agencies like the DEQ and um, um, internally with other departments within OMA on a consistent basis. With metric implementation, there was a clear bottleneck at the, the lab level that Lee's team uh, tackled uh, and is still tackling. So they uh, handled about 904 metric tickets. They're down to about 80 tickets a week. They work directly with metric to help get those uh, bottlenecks unclogged. Uh, and they are now able to use metric data to actually evaluate what's going on in the industry. So we're on the other side of just unclogging bottlenecks and they're able to actually look at data and uh, look at outliers. It's very interesting the information that we're able to see. We're able to see the outliers on the really high uh, potency. We're able to see outliers on pesticides, heavy metals, residual solvents. We're able to see uh, where those are coming from and really hone in on um, truly we're able to hone in on where we should be investigating and where we should be inspecting. And it, it helps us see who is, tr who's trying to take advantage of the system. One big project that Lee has been working on before it became a legislative mandate is lab standardization. It became an official project November, 2022 and he's continuing to work on it with a group of licensed laboratories to make sure that we meet or exceed the legislative mandate to make it happen. Uh, on the other side of this, every single licensed lab will have standardized procedures, standardized equipment, standardized SOPs, and um, there will be much more uh, confidence that the results you're getting from a lab are, um, are in fact quality results. Is that a fair statement, Lee? And then our, another large department that I think you all are interested in because you all deal with our compliance department on a regular basis. Um, our compliance department is led by Michelle Reddish. Do you mind? She has the largest department by far at OMA with over 100 employees. Most of them are out in the field on a daily basis all across Oklahoma. We staffed up really quickly and the result of staffing up quickly, of course, is that there are a lot of um, <clears throat> growing pains, I'll say. And I'm here to not make excuses for those growing pains. I'm here to own those growing pains uh, personally. And we can talk more about that um, if you guys have questions about that. But I want to give you some uh, updates on 
what all they've been able to accomplish despite the despite the hurdles and the um, it, it hasn't been easy. Uh, our compliance department has just now is just now implementing their first ever actual software. They've done everything they've done utilizing uh, basically spreadsheets. Um, it is it's been a Herculean task <laughs> to do what they've done. We could have waited and waited for something to be perfect, and instead we just got out there and did it. And um, what resulted is, yeah, we've made a lot of we've made mistakes, and um, that's truly because I've pushed I've pushed people probably beyond um, what everyone's comfortable doing. But I would say that the, I heard a hum over there, but I will. <laughs> I'll take it, but we I pushed, and what I think the result is that we've we've gotten things done, and we are continuing to move forward, and we will perfect the processes moving forward. And I, you guys will always see progress from us, and that's what I can promise you. So, with the compliance department, I am impressed because they are continuously moving forward and improving, especially under Michelle's leadership. So, we are in a position where we have done over ten thousand four hundred inspections. And if you'll recall, in August of 2021, when we did our hard reset, we had barely done any inspections. Most of you had never seen an OMA employee, right? You didn't, maybe didn't even know if we really existed. I hope all of you have now met an OMA employee. Maybe you are not so sure about the information you received, but you met an OMA employee. <laughs> We are working on the training piece, and that is a high priority for us. And I mean, this week we are working on the training, um, and that is a promise to you guys. We're working on um, multiple levels of training. But we're getting out. We want to answer questions. We want to be a resource, and we want to make sure that you guys know that we're actually out there. Um, we're building out the referral systems for our inspectors. So not only are they out there, they have resources if they see something um, that's not legitimate. So it's not, if, if they're at one of your places and it is legitimate and it's a great inspection, cool. But if they're at a place that they walk away saying, nope, I need to call the sheriffs, they are getting all, they have, they're building all of those resources. We are building those out with them to make sure that we are tackling the problems that you guys are seeing in your local communities and that the sheriffs are calling us about and that the citizens of Oklahoma are seeing on a daily basis as well. So as far as the regions, McGregor, can you put that up, please? It was just magic yesterday. I can just explain it, it's okay. Yeah, it's on our website. Yesterday I, I spoke it into existence, I think. It was magic. <clears throat> Thank you. Just so you can take a moment to see how the state is split you can see where you fit as far as regions go. And this is specific to our compliance department, right? I don't know that this really affects any other department. No. Thank you, McGregor. And we are still statutorily required to do these operational status visits just to see if you and the rest of our licensees are operational. And so we completed 11,421 of those in 2022. Those take a lot of time. So we're hoping to clean that up and be able to do those simultaneously. And here's the staffing data on just the compliance department. So our compliance inspectors, that's our field team. These are the people that are out across the state in the regions. <clears throat> we have 84. And then we've, uh, Michelle has built a complaints team 
that focuses specifically on deep dives into complaints. And they work closely with our investigations team. And there are seven people on that team. And if I'm not mistaken, they're all former law enforcement. Yes. And ex-military. And then we have a team of auditors, so for a total of 99 field staff. When, uh, in August 2021, I don't wanna harp on this, it's just to help you guys see the difference. I really actually couldn't get a straight answer on how many field staff we had at first, but it was somewhere around maybe 12-ish, I don't know, 12-ish, but I, could, it, I couldn't, get a straight answer. Um, so we've come a long way in a short period of time. And some highlights that the compliance department wanted to make sure that all of you know are on the screen and you can read through those. But we are using the data that we get from metric and NCS analytics to drive where we should be doing our inspections. Based on the flowering time, harvest weight discrepancies. And we, as I said earlier, will be reporting the top flags that we receive on the dashboard soon. We're working on that on the back end. So that there, it will be transparent that you know what data we're pulling and how we're using it. And as far as training and development, which is something very important to everyone, our entire compliance department has been in training this week. The 17th, they were in all day classroom style training and then the 18th, they were out in the field. And um, they're gonna continue. I, Michelle has planned out um, weekly, quarterly um, training for the compliance staff and she's partnering with NCS to deliver region-specific trainings to make sure they understand how to use that data. And really, that is it. And now we are gonna turn it over to make sure we give you guys plenty of time to get your questions and answers in. I'm sorry I took a little more time than I was supposed to. Hello, the first up to speak is Glenn Jerome. When you come up, please push the button so the microphone's on. We are recording this and it will be available on our YouTube page after. Push that button. Good. Okay, so you did answer a lot of the questions I had. And uh, in addition to that, I'd like to uh, thank you guys for having this this morning. It's, uh, I think, a, a long time coming. Um, I did want to mention that uh, specifically to the point that you just brought up about uh, metric, I think that a lot of the, uh, the flags you're going to see are because metric is a terribly uh, unintuitive program. Uh, by default, it's, it's not how we harvest plants. We don't, traditionally we haven't weighed them wet. I understand we do that now, but uh, it's not very intuitive. We don't harvest uh, plants twice and we're technically required to do that in metric, even though they can only be harvested once. But uh, anyways, um, I believe the licensed business owners who put items into metric are probably not skirting the rules for the most part. I think the people that don't have licenses and the illegal grows are the ones that are probably skirting the rules. Um, with uh, the next subject, with the uh, upcoming ODAFF registration requirement, once active, will that be enforced by um, OMMA or another government agency as far as compliance? So the registration with ODAF regarding um, sensitive crop, mm -hmm. uh, I don't believe that that's going to be, um, no, 
I don't believe that we will be enforcing that. Okay. Um, you also made a point uh, earlier uh, in, in when you were speaking in regard to the 90 days uh, for submission. I also wanted to point out what the state law says. The state law says 90 days. It doesn't say 90 business days. Because if we were to take that context and extrapolate it, our licenses would be like 365 business days. So that'd be like, like 500 days, right? It says the state law actually reads 90 days. It does not read 90 business days. Um, uh, I did have a couple of points to make about the uh, application process in particular. I don't understand why myself, I've had a license here since year one, uh, as a not only as a caregiver, which I'll get to in a minute, but um, as a grower, as a commercial grower, and that's four years now that I've had a license. I've had to prove residency for four years. I've been here for more than two years. By default, I think that if, uh, I think that licensees should be approved without having to go spend the extra money for a, uh, I guess the background check is okay, even though they don't always get passed. But I think that, um, that by default, a licensed grower should be approved, or a licensee should be approved regardless of what they are, once they've had a license for two years or more and not be required to continue to submit additional documents that prove they've been here for two years. Because as your rules reflect, as OMMA's rules reflect, if we change anything significant, significant in our information about our business or our company, we're required to submit that information already. So it is counterintuitive for us to then have to prove residency, especially, um, for example, the Secretary of State's uh, trade name certification document that I'm required to upload, even though I've only had one and I've continued to upload the same one, I do have a current application that's been rejected now three times because of an inaccurate document. And I can promise you I'm um, smart enough to upload the right document each time. I also think that the fact that if a document is rejected uh, or not accepted, that it's removed from the application whenever we go resubmit is uh, not ideal because I would have liked to have been able to see the document that was apparently or allegedly uploaded by myself that was rejected because it's not there anymore. I just have an opportunity to upload another document. I uploaded the same one again yesterday, and so I look forward to seeing what the results of that are. Um, you did actually do a very thorough job in um, addressing most of my concerns. Um, I was also curious if the agency is aware of or have a comment on the fact that metric, the system we are required to use by the rules or state law, um, that they continue to uh, gather our cookie and uh, browser data whenever we log in and they sell that information to third party companies. It's pretty rampant and it slows down the actual system use quite, uh, quite significantly. And, it, and it, if uh, I would like to know where those funds go as well because they're selling our information. It's a clear, I've got the software on my devices that show me exactly where they're selling that information to and how many times they're pinging my browser and cookie data. It's quite profound, actually. I think that that system, although it's not good anyways, it, it would probably be a little bit more um, effective and uh, streamlined if they didn't spend so much time like rating our data. Um, I also am probably one of many people here who's not the most thrilled with the amount of response time when we call it OMA. Um, I th the best um, example I can give is it was only a 39 minute hold this year when I called OMA. Uh, that's quite a long time to wait on the phone. Um, also, uh, something I didn't see that was mentioned up there in regards to legislation was the um, badges that are going to be put into enforcement. Is that going to be something that OMA, OMA may will be required to enforce? How does that help licensed growers or licensees whatsoever? We staff our, our places with the people we have, and I don't know that any, any of them will be any better or myself will be any safer or more effective by having to spend more money on more items like a badge. I understand what they do in Colorado, but once again, this is not Colorado. This is Oklahoma. It's a lot different. Um, that The uh, badges are, in my opinion, another example of the nonstop fees and changes that continue to occur, whether it be a magical blue zip tie that holds the 45-cent tag to our plant that we can only use three times, or uh, the re requirement to have all of our license or all of our employees into metric. These fees continue to add up, and especially whenever you're a grower and a processor like myself or multiple license, there's two different metrics for every employee. There's two different fees. 
Um, I think to date, just on licensing applications, fees, and metric, uh, since inception, I've spent over $42,000, and there's only four people on my staff. And I've only got two licenses, so it becomes quite absorbent after a while, and I would like to see some of those uh, issues addressed and perhaps uh, taken a little bit further uh, into context as far as um, being specific as to how it's helping us, because I don't believe a lot of these things help us at all. I think metric is not good, in my opinion. But um, I would like to say that I have seen um, enforcement agents um, as well as the uh, inspectors this year, and I was quite pleased with the progress I made prior to the year over. And I, I do know what you mean when you regarding the spreadsheets and the lack of um, streamlined system that the that the agents had and I, I did notice the improvements and I would also like to say they've been very respectful and respectable people for sure and um it's all I really have at this time I think and I appreciate everyone's time and everyone being here today thank you and Glenn I'll address the badging it is uh senate bill 1704 and it does require us to do it so we're in the rfp process of um Choosing, we have to put out a request for proposal to choose a vendor that will do badging for every single medical marijuana employee in Oklahoma. So we're at the very front end. So look at Senate Bill 1704. It's a really short bill, but it does require it. And there's another bill out there by Cinder Garvin, and I don't remember the bill number, but it would kind of add to it a, an education requirement for me medical marijuana employees across Oklahoma. So just make sure to keep an eye on that. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Maureen McCollum. Okay, press the button. I'm a little nervous. We're not used to being away from our plants in front of all these people. Uh, my name is Maureen McCollum. I, um, I'm the owner and operator of Arena Farms West, uh, Moe's Grow out of Sepulpa, Oklahoma. I want to thank you so much for having us here. I believe that the um, way you're directing our agency and moving it forward, we all value that. I just want to let you know that. And I just want to give you a little background myself. I spent the last 20 years in Oklahoma in the oil and gas industry as a petroleum geologist. Um, in 2019, our industry took a nosedive and I was able to use that as a catalyst to get into something that I love and feel very passionate about, which is growing, something I've done all my life, not necessarily illegally. Um, but anyway, uh, we called it, they called it green oil. And so, you know, it was gonna fill our state coffers just like oil and gas does when it's up there. When it's down there, it doesn't do it so much. I've worked for everybody from a one-man show to um, the largest campus in Oklahoma City. And I found that there are a lot of parallels between our industries. Um, one of them is that the bigger the company, the more lawyers they can hire and the more they can bend the rules. The smaller people, we just don't get that. You know, I'm a one person show here. Um, we, our product is a commodity, just like oil and gas. Um, we are driven by market forces and um, it, when it's good, it's good, like the beginning, and when it's bad, it's bad. It's hard to be in there. Um, the vast majority are small and medium-sized companies. That goes for oil and gas here in Oklahoma, and it also goes for those of us. We're small and medium-sized companies. There hasn't been a major in Oklahoma in decades. You don't hear BP, Shell, Exxon here. And that's I think that's how it is here with cannabis, but... If we're overregulated and overtaxed, it's not going to be that way. We're not going to be able to survive. And I feel like as soon as um, marijuana is taken off the Schedule One, Pfizer's and Philip Morris's are going to move in. So we've got to um, protect ourselves here. Also, um, I feel like we're seen as a cash cow for the state and other um, entities, the um, cities, the counties. They, they all want a piece of us. Utilities, I don't know if you guys are aware, but there are utility companies that are gouging us. They are charging us surcharges just because we are in the cannabis industry. They're refusing to hook up. They're doing things like that. I want to address metric mostly. In my uh, industry, I've used some very, very powerful software, 3D software. I know what to do and how to use it. Metric is the worst software I've ever used in my entire career. And... 
when when we do use our software in the can in the oil and gas industry, those software companies are competing against each other for our business. They come to our companies, they give us training. Once a month they come and they train us. We call, they give us booklets. Metric does not have to compete with anyone. Therefore, they don't give a crap if we understand it or we don't. And when we have to put all our stuff in, it, it's too late for so many growers in Oklahoma. It's too late for them. But I just, that's what I want to see is metric compete with other companies. And um, thank you for your time. That was short. <laughs> thank you, Maureen. <clears throat> I appreciate your comments very much. And we're aligned a lot in, in our opinions on the similarities. I, our difference is that I see um, oil and gas, well, I see cannabis as 1920 oil and gas in Oklahoma. So um, the 1920s in oil and gas in Oklahoma was the there will be blood phase, um, if you've seen that movie. So it's a, you know, it's it's highly competitive. You know, people are trying to get their stake in the industry and um, there was no software. So whoever kind of made it first. So it's, it's we're in that very early phase of people trying to make it. But there are so many um, parallels to the industries and I agree with you. And thank you for your comments and, and your perspective. Next up to speak is Sean Willis. Good morning. Well, this is really strong. I my language might bear some of you may not understand well, but uh, I have a small little question. Then the two minutes, and I try my best to see how they go. Uh, my first question is: Right now in Oklahoma, where the uh, we have minority people here in Oklahoma growing marijuana. Many of the uh, minority, they don't speak in right English. So my question to you is, are there going to be a translation in it? And then the second question is, many of the growers have struggled with power company. We don't have, they don't connect uh, power into our farm. So we have struggled on that. And then the uh, third question for me is the OBNDD is a problem with the uh, many of our because we have to renew our application ahead of time at the deadline end, but there's no work back from there for three, four months now. And we just want, want it to work just like us. We work, we comply. It, or BNET doesn't uh, respond what they're doing now. So we don't know what's going on. Okay, Madrid. Many of the uh, minority people from Southeast Asia, they are not speaking English or writing English. They have problem with the matter. So I like to request a training, special surely for this kind of group of minority people, is that possible? What, <clears throat> what specific languages would the uh, translators need to speak and would the training need to be in? The uh, language uh, uh, that we have uh, is called Hmong, but it's uh, necessary to have a Hmong language. But at least we have a training where we can do the translate in Hmong in that training. That will help the uh, grower a lot. So specifically Hmong would be the best one? Correct. Okay. The Hmong is not an uh, immigrant. They are refugees from Laos, which is uh, during the Vietnam War. Um, I think that we can go back and look at what the majority 
translation services are not out of the question. We do need to look, we need to just take a survey and figure out what translation services we need the most and we can look into that for sure. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a valid question that we need to look into. Can you make sure that Naomi has your contact info? Okay, sure. Thank you. And on OBNDD with no response, I'm not exactly sure how to help you, but we can get back with you if you give your contact to Naomi. Thank you. Next up to speak is Jace Rivera. I'm gonna turn it off. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jace Rivera. I'm from Touched by Cannabis. Um, I am a nationally recognized educator and cultivator and I would first like to volunteer my time with OMMA so could understand the cultivation process of this plant because it seems as though there is a large um, lack of education in just the education and just the way the other speaker addressed in the harvesting, um, but just the overall cultivation, how waste gets tracked, how things are recorded, um, and I would be more than happy to volunteer my time um, for that. Um, first, I would like to address um, what appears to be unnecessary testing between vertically integrated businesses. Um, I am a cultivator and processor, and currently I am required to test product within my own company. So to transfer it to my processing company, I have to do a full compliance testing on that, even though it never leaves the freezer it's harvested and put in. So just as we were talking as a small uh, family owned company, it is a huge increase in cost to have that inherited double processing that I have to do. Um, so that's something that is a huge, a huge issue on the cultivation and business side and being that metric and OMMA are joined businesses, um, where my business is stacked in metric together, I should be able to transfer to a processing company that is owned by the same business without having it tested as long as products tested prior to being released to the market. Um, the next one that I would also like to address is um, <clears throat> the difference in compliance data and the double work that has to be done between metric and OMMA inspection checklists. Um, one of those would be that I'm required to track multiple things within an OMMA Excel spreadsheet that can be uh, viewed by the inspectors. Most of that information can be pulled from metric. Um, my last inspection, I offered to show my OMMA inspector my waste log pulled from metric and she told me she didn't care about metric. She only wanted to see my individual spreadsheets and we're a two person operation and so having to do this double data entry input um, into multiple systems is a, a huge administrative uh, feat. Um, I worked for Lockheed Martin for 18 years doing software development, doing um, process integration and a quality inspector. And so these are things where there is a lot of unnecessary touch labor within these systems. Um, some of it makes it very unintuitive to the user and it's very unuser friendly. Um, I think those are my two major things. The vertically integrated testing should be a very simple thing to fix. There should be no reason I have to test the product that I've grown before I can process it. Okay. Definitely understand where you're coming from. Um, I think we need to talk more about that. It's a, since it's a standard rule about the, the testing standard um, does not contemplate vertically integrated basically. Microphone, please, Lee. Microphone, Lee. I understand the situation that you're in. That would require a statute change. The requiring of testing from a grow license to a processing license is stated in statute. That's where the testing is required. So. As Adrian mentioned, you need to get in touch with uh, your senator or representative because that will require a statute change. And, and um, I feel, though, Lee, that that is where the lack of education 
in the OMMA side is on how some of these things have been written and presented because in the statute, I can understand that it is a grow to a processor and that can be a business to different business. But if it is vertically integrated, it is nothing but in crude extensive cost to us small business owners. And just by the map you showed, for me to have to have additional testing for every single product that I have to do, and it's not just that, but if I wanna make infused pre-rolls, I have to test the flour, I have to test the hash, then I put it together and I have to test it again. This is three different tests that I have to do for one product that came from the same grow, from the same thing. So, I mean, I'm, I'm up to $1,000 in testing to put out one product. So at the Senate level, or is that where it needs to be addressed at? Because I think there are several people who are in this same boat and I would be happy to start a petition to start getting names on that. But who, who would I talk to, Lee, or how would I start that? That would be, that would be your own uh, uh, legislative representative from your district. And uh, along those same lines, um, the more voices that they hear, uh, the, the, the more impact you're gonna have on that message. Okay, thank you. And if there is somebody I could give my contact info to, like I said, I would be more than happy to volunteer my time yeah. and effort to help understand the process of cultivating this plant. Yeah, absolutely. And I wanna just kind of let you know that, yes, you getting in touch with your legislature, legislators will, will be really helpful because your specific experience is your specific experience. I'm, I'm sure there are other people in here who have similar ones and we collect these stories and we can kind of tell anecdotally, but there are so many stories that need to be told. That's why Lee gives you that advice. And I just want to make sure to kind of on the record say, when you say that OMA and metric are connected joint joined businesses, that is not, that's a false statement. We're a state government agency who, um, um, there, the contract was put in place by, uh, the, OMES with metrics. So we're not a business. They are a business. They are a private industry. We are a state government agency. So I just want to make sure you understand that. I, I do understand. I just, when there is data that you guys are collecting and pulling from that system that I have to double input into additional administrative paperwork for review when an inspection is done. Definitely understand your point on that. And there's no reason you should be d doing double work. I want to make sure you know my point on that. No, we will address that. You shouldn't have to do unnecessary double work. Um, we will address that on our, our side. So thank you for sharing that with me. Thank you for your time this morning. Next up to speak is Marla Haycox Lingo. Good morning. Um, I'd like to start um, by thanking you, uh, Director Barry, and your wonderful staff. There has been a marked increase in um, ability to find out what we need to find out. And even though we may wait on the phone for 30 minutes to get a call answered, we can I see results and it's, it's, um, I see changes, positive changes and thank you for all you do. I have a, a, a wonderful inspector. I'm, I'm a, I'm a grower in Northwest Oklahoma, former music teacher. So that was kind of a, a big shift. My husband is a wheat farmer. So we see, uh, the differences between agriculture and marijuana agriculture. And um, a lot of the things that were addressed earlier, and, and I agree with a lot of the things that people have been saying, but we do see, um, for instance, the registration for a sensitive crop. I, I'm, in a, I'm in Northwest Oklahoma, and um, my, um, I've had, a, I had to put up a greenhouse because my, um, my building was delayed for a year by the state fire marshal um, because we were one of the first people that built the building. And I've had my license since October 2018, and I've um, 
operated within the law based on what my lawyer told me to do. I've been through DEQ. We've, we've had inspections from, um, of course, the state fire marshal, certificates of occupancy, and, and I built a greenhouse in order to, um, to grow while I was working on my building and my building and my building and getting all the, the navigating the, um, um, the red tape to get everything up to code. Um, the approval process for the plans was the biggest thing through the state fire marshal. But um, I have had crop spray affect my greenhouse. Um, my husband has had that in his agriculture business, and he has, um, I mean, farmers carry insurance just for that purpose. That's why he's a wheat farmer, and I'm a marijuana farmer. He cannot be a marijuana farmer if he wants to be a wheat farmer because his insurance is federally backed by the Farm Services Association. So he... Um, He's had to pay damages when he's had a crop sprayed and his neighbor farmer had his crop destroyed because his, they didn't, you know. I understand why farmers, agricultural farmers, are upset with marijuana farmers because maybe what we don't understand is if we have a crop damaged, we can sue them for damages because they destroyed our crop. And that's what they're all scared about. Okay, the insurance factor. Um, I got into a rabbit hole, I'm sorry. Um, I've invested everything. My retirement, my life savings, my husband's farm equity. <laughs> we have, we're all in. And we run a really tight ship. Um, I have two other employees. I'm the grower. I'm the head grower. I'm the the metric person, I'm the owner, I'm, I pay the bills, I do the finance, I pay, you know, everything. I wear 15 hats and I have two really good employees. Um, the more regulations, the more, um, I have to hire a CPA obviously, but um, everything affects me as far as um, metric is difficult. Thintia cloud is difficult. Um, I see the, the, the value in badges and, and um, employees. I have been through 35 employees in four years because, yes, we do background checks, but, you know, <laughs> it would be nice to have that vetting and that tracking of that person's work history so that I don't have to go through three or four months of figuring out, is this person gonna work? Or are they gonna destroy my crop? Um, I'm sorry, I'm out of time. And, but um, I agree with people, excessive testing. Um, um, indoor growers spend more money and the quality is better, but my ad valorem taxes on inventory um, because it's not grown in the ground. My husband doesn't have to pay inventory on his wheat, but I do on my potted plants, if, even in the greenhouse. Um, please ask our legislators to protect the small independent growers who are operating on a shoe stream, who've invested everything, and um, every time they enact another thing, we have to adjust, punt, Thank you so much for all that you do. I really appreciate you all. Thank you for coming out. Thank you for sharing. And I specifically remember your comment on the forum. So thank you. Thank you for sharing. Next up to speak is Ernie Nice. Gilbert, can you watch the clock so we make sure we get everybody time? Thank you. Hi, hey, Director Berry. Good morning. My name is Ernie Nitch. I'm with uh, Texoma Labs vertically integrated across uh, southern Oklahoma. The multiple grow issue, um, in our particular case, we have multiple grows, different locations. Currently, I like to hang them all and dry them at one location. In order to do that, I have to test the plants before they're moved, which means that I'm doing the testing 
before it's ready. I get it tested, and I'm able to then move it from one location to the other. And then once it's properly dried, honestly, then I do another test, and the tests are different. It was okay before metric, because you really looked at the different testing. But now it's gonna look like I've got you know, different testing. It's gonna raise a lot of questions. So, because there is no rules, or there's no, uh, the rules won't contemplate having multiple locations even under the same license, the same license type. I understand by statute from a grow to a processing, you have to test, but um, I don't know if there's any wiggle room with the regulations or with enforcement where if you have one grow, you can sort of move it. That's one issue that affects me. I don't know if that affects a lot of others. Another small issue, 200 business days in the year. Two weeks ago, I got two um, OMA inspection requests, same day, same time. And I had to call them and say, hey, look, I can't be in two places at one time. The response is, well, we've got to get it done, figure it out. You have to have more than one person at each location. Um, these inspections are very personal to me because the repercussions are so serious. I like to be on site myself as the stakeholder. And I like to see some better understanding of, well, you know, I'm not saying I can't miss my kid's soccer game and I can't make it. This is I have two scheduled at the same time. Is there some leeway there? I had an issue with, I had a license that it was in renewal. The 30th day came and it was a Sunday. I thought I had till the next Monday. I learned I did not. I believe state law is it goes to the next business day. Um, I'll have to find out. The only repercussion now is I'm going to have to file a lawsuit to try to reinstate that license. There is no one day grace period, two day grace period on a renewal application. I know on a normal application, if you miss a deadline, I think there's a $500 fee, but everything else is just automatic termination. You're off the metric immediately. And that's very detrimental, at least it was to me. And um, I don't know how long the licensing time frame's taking. It seems like it's taking a long time for our licenses. And the last issue I wanted to mention is, I know like with the Attorney General, you can ask for an advisory opinion or excuse me, a state legislature or someone can. Right now, there's no mechanism to get any kind of feedback or to get a rule interpretation where everybody can read and say it's very hodgepodge, it just seems to me. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I was taking notes and the, so I wanna clarify for our team that's listening and taking notes. You grow at one location, you wanna be able to move it to dry it at another location. Correct. Okay. Yeah, I think we need to look at our rules and make sure that, because that was not contemplated. Um, so you have two grow licenses, or you have two of the same license to be able to do that. Correct, I have multiple grow licenses. Okay. And then we need to discuss the scheduling of the, um, if it, there's one owner, making sure we don't schedule inspections at the same time making sure that we talk through that. Missing the renewal, I will have to talk with our legal team. I can't, I don't know, I can't comment on that at this exact time without knowing all the details. Licensing renewals are taking a little bit longer. Uh, for several reasons, we're taking longer um, on doing due diligence. Our licensing software, um, as I did discuss yesterday, we are having, we are having trouble with our licensing software and there's no reason for me to mince words. We're um, we are um, in the phase of holding them accountable and uh, ha having to have uh, check-ins with them on a daily basis to make sure they are meeting goals that we're setting for them. I'll put it that way. Um, the AG opinion uh, situation is really specific to the AG, but I do understand the gist of what you're asking. We have to see um, specific to state agencies, especially regulatory agencies, what is allowed um, and go from there, to working with the legal counsel. They're listening and I we'll, we'll see what we can Well, even can in, do. in some sort of informal one, where even you say, hey, these are non-binding, it's just questions we've gotten and these are our initial answers. And I don't know if that is possible or not, but even if it's informal, it would be helpful. Yeah. Okay, can we As move to our thank you. Thank you. next thank you, speaker? Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is John Kumbis. Have we met? 
Hello, everybody. Like I said during uh, yesterday's town halls, thank you guys for coming. I appreciate y'all. This is amazing. But I want to make a couple statements real quick. People are asking me to ask these questions on my live feed. Uh, first, you made a statement, uh, Director Barry, that um, we're four years in and people are still trying to make a stake in this industry. That is not correct. These small mom and pops that are here, you don't see any big time growers, no national brands out here. These small mom and pops... They're just trying to survive in this market. And every time we get strangled because more bills, more bills, more bills, more money. So to all you mom and pop growers out there, I love y'all. And I appreciate every single one of you guys. Keep doing what you're doing. Uh, you have my support 100%. Number two, when bills come to y'all in regards to the marijuana industry, who looks at them? Who is up at the Capitol fighting for us? Like this whole sign law. When that bill came to you guys, did anybody in Oma go, man, that is the dumbest bill ever? This is, this is putting people's life in jeopardy. Putting a big old sign in front of your grow in the middle of nowhere that says, hey, I grow weed. I don't live on site. Come steal and rob from me. This is everything I have. So my question is, who is advocating for the businesses at Oma when it comes to those bills that you guys see? Um, I don't know. Go ahead. Do you have other questions? Because we'll get okay, back to that one. I got you. I got you. Um, no, that's all I got. I can't read my own dang writing. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Director Barry. My, my bad. But I do appreciate you guys. I really do. I know I'm a loud guy in this state and stuff, and I do these live feeds for people that can't be here and everything. But I do honestly appreciate you guys. You guys have come leaps and bounds from the other three people that were in your position. So I do applaud you. Thank you. Um, I appreciate it. So I, I, I want to be so clear for you guys. Look, if a bill comes to us and it's uh, saying, it's the legislature saying we want the, we want grows to put a sign out front. We're going to say, okay, uh, have you run that by grows in your district? What do you want me to say? <laughs> I don't understand what y'all want me to say. We can give them, we can give them, we can give them uh, a logical, I'm a state government agent, agency. I am a state government employee. You guys own these businesses. Go talk to your legislators. Don't put this on me, okay? You own these businesses. Don't get me riled up up here, okay? Don't, don't do it. All right, listen. And you're not, y'all want someone to blame? It's not me. Okay? It's not. I'm sorry you feel like. We're just asking, like, when y'all when get those bills. They don't bring, bring it to us and ask for our permission to pass a bill. That's no, not how this works. But, but it, you said earlier that you read every single bill that has to do with marijuana. So my question is, who in Oma is advocating for marijuana? Because I'm going to tell you We did. We invited all legislators. I'm, okay, I can don't see any. We moved I to the. I see other state officials in the room, but yesterday we did have. Do you want me to introduce you? No. Okay. We have. <laughs> 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 we have. Um, <laughs> we had a state legislator yesterday, but listen, you guys. Um, there's a lot. There's just. There's a lot to understand, and we read every bill, and that is one bill that look. When we put every single thing on the website, there is so much information out there about every single bill going through the legislative process. I don't understand. What I will never understand is how the outrage came on June 1 instead of February through May. You won't convince me, so we can move on. Next. Oh, next up to speak is Christy O'Neill. Hi, Christy. Um, was on. First of all, thank you uh, again for being here today. If you don't know who your senator and representative is, please get with me or with the or or organization. They will let you know. 
these people don't have the opportunity to really have a lot of say in what our government is doing to us, for us. Um, we have to do it. So we had a town hall meeting. We invited Senator Jett. He came out and he said, educate me. We have to go to every one of our senators and representatives and do that same thing. We're currently planning six of those events throughout the state. Reach out to your senator. Let's plan one in their district where we can tell them and we can have everyone, their constituents in there saying, this is what we need help with. This is what we need you to do for us. Um, every agency, as many have said, charges us. Um, in Lincoln County, it's $2,000 to get a piece of paper for compliance. They don't even show up. I've never had one of them show up. We had our license for nine months. The electric company sent me a nasty gram saying that they have, without my permission, switched me to a commercial account and backdated my bill for six months. And if I didn't pay $2,900, by the due date, I would be disconnected. I had no say, no choice. They have that power. And I don't have OG&E. Um, OG&E actually helps our industry. <laughs> um, but everything is at the And now our county, our fire departments are saying, we have to go to these grows and we have to do stuff more often. And my son's a fireman, so I'm not complaining against the <laughs> fire departments. But the money is not getting spread down to the people who are on the forefront having to help the people at our doors. But the in-between agencies, for me to get a license, even though to you it's only 2,500, it's, I have to do it online, so I pay a processing fee of 5820. And then I have to get my OMA online, or my uh, OBNDD, which is another 500, plus I have to have my compliance, which is $2,000. Plus I have to have this, plus I have to that. On one year license, just on my grow, and we're vertical, just on my grow, it cost me $6,027.42 to maintain that license. One of my seven licenses. It varies by county, varies by city, and I don't know how the people in Oklahoma City do it because I've been in on some of their inspections from the different things, and that's chaos in and of itself. But Somebody has to stop the fees that we're having to incur at every level. Um, something that came up yesterday was the sample thing, and I know I'm out of time, but I'm going to keep talking. Um, <laughs> something that came up yesterday was the sample issue. This is a see it, smell it, taste it, touch it industry. And I take my product to a dispensary. I'm against the law. I can't take that chance. Um, if we could figure out some way and let us know if it's through our government or if y'all can do it, of creating a sample pack for us and the processors to be able to take. I don't mind checking it out. I don't mind saying I left this joint at this place or this package of edibles at this place. But if I could legally transport a sample pack where I don't have to keep redoing everything every time. And okay. thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. I do think that's something that would be a statute change, but it's also something that we could talk to the legislature about. It's something that it makes sense. Okay, next up is Stephen Honeycutt, and please uh, make sure to abide by the time. Sweet Gilbert. He is. He's very nice. He's not going to cut you guys off. Come on. Good morning. Thank you very much for, uh, for having us. My name is Stephen Honeycutt, and uh, I'm representing OKC All Stars LLC. Uh, I'm kind of in charge of managing the daily activities you know, of their startup. Um, my background, uh, family history on my dad's side, Chickasaw uh, farmers. Uh, we're currently landowners in Bowley, Oklahoma. Uh, I did about 15 years territory management in the oil industry, and uh, due to what I did in that industry, OKC All Stars kind of trust me. You know, with kind of doing their, their startup. But I guess it's kind of like best practices kind of moving forward because we've already kind of gone through the process, but just try to make it better for people that are coming after us. Um, like they acquired a grow license and, you know, I ran through some hurdles just trying to get up to speed with everything. Um, and just recently got like a revocation letter that we've kind of worked through. But I guess the question is like moving forward, 
for people that do acquire licenses, is there going to be like maybe some kind of support um, that they'd have just being a, brought up to speed with what the previous owners kind of left, you know, because we kind of inherited, you know, just some boogers. And I didn't really know because I'm new to the industry, but doing my due diligence, we figured things out, we're moving forward. So the owner just kind of wanted me to ask, you know, just on behalf of anybody that's coming after us, you know, is there any kind of support for new owners that are acquiring like licenses? Uh, in addition to that, you know, with the startup process, uh, another question they'd like me to ask is, um, you know, as far as getting like MEPs and drawings, like from Architect um, in OKC, you know, for the same footprint, I've gotten quotes from like 7000 and up to just recently like $57,000, you know, for drawings like MEPs. So I don't know if this would be a question for y'all, but probably for kind of the community here, like, you know, is there any guidance? you know, to kind of avoid the extortion, you know, kind of game that we've been experiencing out here. So thank you very much for y'all's time. Thank you. Um, as far as, I have a real quick question, if you don't mind walking too far, Stephen. Stephen. Um, so did you guys, uh, you purchased a license from someone else? Is yeah. that my understanding? Yeah, they purchased a license. And uh, I think one thing was just like a, uh, there was a violation that they didn't pay. It was like 500 bucks. And, you know, I'm, was still trying to get up to speed, like with Dentia and just looking at everything. I thought we'd paid OBNDD, we'd, uh, you know, brought everything up to speed. And it's that one, I got a letter in the mail saying, hey, we had to respond within 10 days and pay the fee, which we were able to do. But just for people after us, I'm like, I don't know if somebody else would have been able to do that. So I think that you coming here and telling us this, it's something we're working on and we, we do need to figure out these license transfers are ramping up because of the moratorium and it's something that we have got to figure out. So um, let's make sure that we have your contact information with Naomi after this session so that we can be in touch with you to understand your experience and utilize that to inform how we deal with this moving forward because we do need to understand better. Sounds good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Next up to speak is Austin Jones. Going once, going twice, next. Next up to speak is Jared Miskowski. If Austin comes back, we can give their, that person a chance. Hi, my name is Jared Miskowski from Tranquilo LLC in Shawnee. Um, this is a metric issue that we've just run into um, during the injunction uh, the 10 month injunction where metric was not in place, uh, we're being charged $40 a month for the time during the injunction where we were not allowed to use metric, but we had signed into the software and they're saying that because we signed into the software during the injunction that our account was active. And so they're charging us the $400 for that 10 months. And I uh, sent in a contact form to OMA 16 days ago. And um, I was told in, that somebody would call me back and nobody's gotten back to me. And here we are. So <clears throat> during the injunction, you were you were allowed to use metric. There are people in this room that were utilizing metric the entire time of the injunction because that, that was a business choice they made. So I wanna be clear on that. Um, so you weren't utilizing metric as a as a seed to sale system during the injunction. No, you signed in just what one time. Or... Well, we had entered, you know, product into the okay. the software because we were maintaining compliance. But then the injunction was in our product was in there. Gotcha. We had employees that needed to be familiar with metric if in fact it was going to come online and if, yeah. it, if it went through then we would be prepared yeah you want and to be so ready so we were trying to be compliant but now we're being penalized for having even signed in and not been used properly. completely understand okay we will we have the right people that will get in touch with you about that so just make sure naomi has your contact info okay. she's the she's the magic one Well, what I think there's a, a misunderstanding or they're not being fully transparent with OMA okay. in saying that we're not charging the businesses for time that they that it was not in effect, when which OMA is assuming that that means during the injunction you're not charging. That's not what they're doing. They're saying if you even just used your password, that that is deeming it to be an active account. Okay. 
I don't know. I haven't been having those conversations, so we need. I need to make sure to talk it's with the staff. It's forty bucks a month, so I mean, everyone's just kind of paying it. But you know, it's not right because we're paying for a service that we're not getting. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. All right. Next up to speak is Sherry Roberts. Are you Austin that just walked in? No. Okay. Did Austin come in because we called your name and you were gone? Oh, there he goes. Uh, I just want to re reiterate what a lot of people have said. We appreciate you doing this. I think I learned something today that I didn't learn because I keep coming up and talking at these, and then I realize from what he's saying that a lot of stuff we're saying to you is out of your control to even help us. Is, am I understanding that correctly? Some stuff. If it's in statute, I mean, if the legislature yeah. passes a law, we can't change that. Yeah. There are conversations we can have, uh, then, then there are things that are way out of our control. Yeah. As a state government agency, we are charged with um, following the law, basically. Right. I guess I uh, was under the impression maybe that if we came and talked to you, to you guys and there was a common theme that maybe you had some poll with the legislature that says, hey, we've had 50 people come up and say this one thing's an issue. I don't think this is a good law. You guys don't have that kind of... Well, kind of interaction. You know, it, 50 out of 11,000, I don't, where do you, where, <laughs> well, where's the ratio? Well, that's kind of the issue. People, if there are 50 people at your meeting and all 50 of them are saying the same thing, obviously, mm -hmm. you know. We get 6,000 calls a month. Yeah. So I don't, that's the issue. That's yeah. kind of what I'm asking you guys to understand where I'm coming from. Okay. We don't hear the same things from, there's not a. There's not a theme? There's not. Huh. And I would love if there was one. Yeah. It would make my job so easy. I would prance into the Capitol and give them a message if there was a consistent message to give. Well, I'm with Big Dream Cannabis Company and we're just a small mom and pop owned company as well. And one of my things that I brought up at the last meeting was about the signage. I'm a 60 year old woman that has to put a sign on my door saying what I'm doing there. We specifically didn't put anything on our building because we didn't want people to know what we did there and we've already been robbed. And it's causing me great anxiety to have to have the sign on my door. So I don't know if you guys have any pull on that. I know it's already in law, so I just wanted to bring it up again. But since it's already in legislation, the other thing I've brought up before is about testing. And I know it's a common theme, but one thing I can think about that hasn't been brought up today is we're harvesting multiple plants in the same room with the same environment, with the same pesticides, everything. We might have multiple strains, four or five strains, but yet we're required to do full panel testing on all those different strains, whereas it's nothing's going to change but the THC and the terpenes. So we should only have to retest that if it's in the same room with the same harvest with the same conditions. But yet we're having to do $300 full panel testing on every single strain that we put in there. So it doesn't make any sense. You're not going to get different results. <laughs> And so it's causing a burden, especially to smaller. You don't want to do one crop because of the competition. you got to have multiple strains to be able to sell your stuff so you can get it out there. Um, I about used my time asking about the legislation. So <laughs> um, uh, one of the things I did want to say on the metric competition that somebody said, we were using a seed to sell real quick before this that did everything metric did, and it can feed to metric. If you're talking, looking at, if you guys like metric and you're, when we want competition, could we use our seed to sell systems, feed it to metric, you guys still have the metric data and us not have to pay double fees. Like if we're not using metric, but we're using a seed to sell that competes with metric, it feeds data to metric. Maybe we don't have to buy the tags or pay the fees with metric. We do it with our seed to sell. That would be competition. So metric wouldn't have a market cornered. That's oh. all I Want to say I see what you're saying I do see what you're saying and the testing issue at lab Lee heard what you're saying and we, we will discuss what you're talking about okay so he can help me understand better okay thanks okay next up is Tara oh, Tara I'm uh, sorry Felico. real quick Sherry can you make sure to tell Mike in the back about you being robbed I want to make sure our enforcement agents know your situation yeah, we were, we were to you guys. okay perfect okay just make sure that Mike knows. 
Next up to speak is Terrace Falinko. Terrace. Hello. Hey, thanks for trying to get that right. It's Ukrainian, if anybody's wondering. So, fight the Russians. Um, my name is Ross Falenko. I'm uh, with F5 Farms. Uh, I just want to make a couple of comments. One, thank you guys from OMA. We pre I like the things that we're seeing from you guys, and we appreciate the efforts that you're doing. Uh, a resounding theme that we've been talking about here, which is I think by and large, most of us that are attending, we're all in here in this room are trying to do things the right way. Um, the way we can influence the rules that are affecting all of us is go out and meet with our, our state legislators. So OMA's, their job, at least is how I see it, is enforce the rules, uh, go to your state legislators and make an impact that way by telling them about some of the woes that we, we're dealing with. And hopefully they can pass common sense laws. The other method you can do is you can join one of the industry associations. So we've been a member of OCIA, the Oklahoma Cannabis Association. Uh, it's just an industry group. There's a couple out there, but this is the group, from my opinion, that uh, has, we meet monthly. We do monthly updates for members. So, and it's also a good resource that if you want to look for methods to try to have an impact on the laws, you can speak up and, and the group can general give you direction on which path to go, or we as a group work together to go out and meet with the legislators collectively and try and produce positive results that make our industry a little bit better. So Oklahoma Cannabis Association, we also have one member on the board that acts as our lobbyist right now. His name's Mike Irvin. He's in the business. He's a processor and he's also a former congressman. So he brings a lot of value to the organization right now. So those are things to consider. Um, I did have one question. I've got one minute left. NCS analytics, so I like the data. Love the, the idea of the tool. The data looks like it doesn't align with some of the things that are being reported. Like for instance, like number of licenses. And, and I know it's a work in progress. So is, is, there a, is there gonna be a feedback loop? Because I couldn't find any way to like send in a couple questions to tell me what they're, what they're actually trying to purvey to us. So that would be one thing. Um, Second, you mentioned in your talk about training uh, for the regions on the, on the transparency project. Is that for OMA team members or is that going to be for the industry as a whole? Because, that, you know, there's a couple things in there that, you know, we'd like to understand a little bit better. So right now, your, your question about NCS is what my, uh, the, the staff uh, is pulling from me constantly to understand uh, we have we have to explain why NCS is valuable and we're, we're working on that like the, the value of this data is that it's helping inform our uh, how how we do our inspections and we are getting there so what will be on there soon is how we use that data and hopefully you will see you will see that value soon but the training side right now it is on the the internal helping our inspectors utilize the data better but the fact that you said that just kind of clicked clicked a light bulb that we could utilize it on the external side too so we can put some brainstorming in place. yeah well that'd be helpful so we could see you know how many indoor farms how many greenhouse how many outdoor how many harvests how you know those are things that we can make assessments on how we want to plan you know do our business planning and you know try to be smart about it because it is a tight market yeah. uh and then second I know my time is up, but can you clarify? You also talked about how uh, the NCS team is going to help you guys build algorithms for enforcement. So can you speak to that a little bit for the group? Well, it's the, what I said about um, how we have, really what they're doing is pulling uh, data from metric. So it's about people who are licensed by us and utilizing metric and it's pulling um People who are, there are ways, as we all know, in metric to um, find loopholes to following our rules. And so what Lee has found is people who are finding loopholes around um, different reporting mechanisms. Do you mind commenting on that a little bit? 
But one that is specific that intrigues me that I want to make sure that we're utilizing before he goes into it is um, the, the waste. Uh, we, I believe what we have, and this will help us on our enforcement side, we have people who are um, potentially diverting uh, large amounts of, of their harvests, and they're doing that by calling it waste. And so if they are trying to look like they're following the rules and trying to say, no, we're licensed and we're in metric, and so, but oh, we had to waste that entire harvest, and they do that once, okay, maybe that does happen one time. But if it flags us and lets us know that's happening more than once, that we need to go out and really investigate and, and probably do a stakeout and see what's hap actually happening. So things like that are, are going to be easier for us to find out. Uh, well, and I... Avery just clarified pretty well what I was going to say, but basically by put, what NCS is going to be able to do for us is pull that information out of metric, which as you all know, because you're putting it in there, there are thousands of data points at any one time, depending on the size of your operation. So, but what NCS can do is automate what you said you started out with and what ended up at waste and everything in between does that all make sense? And so it, we can put in flags that we can, um, instead of us trying to go through uh, the num numerous licensees that are out there, they're actually in metric doing things and there's a lot. The number of transactions on a monthly basis is gigantic. It's far more than any human being or 20 human beings can actually go through and be thorough so that's why NCS is a, is a tool for us to do that. And all it does, it, it, it just tells us, okay, you need to go look at this right here. There may be something completely innocuous, things we're seeing, things like units of measure and weights, going from pounds to grams, and all of a sudden it looks like you had this many pounds and then this many grams in there when all it was was just convert. If you did the math, they were still the same amount. But it's helping us look at those kinds of things. So that's really, really what it's doing. Um, transfers is another is one in, in particular. Uh, I've got somebody now that's looking at uh, uh, wholesale transfers, and we're seeing transfers of six, seven, eight hundred pounds under one tag number. So that's one of the things that that metric is. I mean, well, metric and NCS uh, can actually survey what's going on and just give us, shine a light on something we may need to look into a little bit further. Okay, all right, thank you. And Taras, I don't know that we have a reporting mechanism on greenhouses versus, until we get, have boots on the ground to actually view our licensees, which we've had this year, but until we, I think that's a manual situation. We don't have that information. Well, I'm just, those are like, but that would be really good info. Like to have, I, yes. I Doesn't actually match. Seven thousand farms instead of seventy one hundred plus farms. Yeah. It's not it's not off by much, but it is a good statistic that can you use the mic, please, Angie, so it's recorded. This is our fabulous COO, Angie Woodrow. Who doesn't like attention? <laughs> okay. Um you're right. We we noticed that early on that the numbers in NCS compared to Thindia were off just a little bit. And that is a, has to do with the definition and how data are fed in there. But we're working on that. And um, actually, we have a call on Friday about that. So today's Thursday. So we're working on it. Yeah, well, uh, it would be helpful like, if, we could, if there was a recent email or something we could send to you know, and ask questions and be like, hey, what does this particular chart mean? It's, some, it's, it's somewhat vague in some areas. I know it's a word of progress. It's just the data is going to be extremely helpful for those of us trying to do future business planning. That makes sense. OK. Hi, I'm, oh, hello. Hi, I'm Kelsey, I'm a communications director. I work really closely with Adam Crabtree, who is the CEO and founder of NCS Analytics. So um, I actually have a note that I've already made that I'm gonna follow up with him to see if there's a way that we can get people who are really interested in the data. Um, his team would probably be willing to answer a lot of questions. He's extremely helpful. 
and was also the most recent guest on our uh, podcast. <laughs> this is true. All right. Um, but that's a, that was a great idea, Taras. Thank you. Next. All right. Next up is Brian Kugel. Next up is Tom Tripinger. Tripinger. Sorry. <laughs> Am on. Last name is pronounced Trapanye, so you were somewhat close. Uh, my name is Tom Trapani. I'm with Deadhead Cannabis out of Oklahoma City. Uh, I guess for the first 14 speakers minus the one, great information. Uh, obviously, I think some of the perception is, is that you guys are at fault for some of the bills that have come forth, which you have no participation once they do become bill. So I understand that too. Um, I came here uh, predominantly for the Senate Bill 1737, which is Section 2, Paragraph 3, the signage. Uh, I've been active in the criminal justice system, still active for 25 years, and we're getting ready to have a problem when we put this signage up. We're going to have lots of break-ins. We're going to have lots of robberies when the signage comes out, in my opinion. Um, I've been broken into twice with no signage, so uh, I think some of us have already experienced that. What I'm going to do today, and what you talked about the association, that is where this industry will help thrive by everybody starting to participate in this association. This association brings us together in this form. This is fantastic. I wish we could do this once a month as we do in the meetings of OCIA. Um, I'm going today, when I leave, I'm going to take this uh, to the legislators, what I want to get changed on this signage is remove the name. If we have the address, we have the phone number, we have our license number, my name has cannabis, deadhead cannabis. Once I put that out there, I know your low level criminals are going to start hitting these facilities for no other reason. Also, if you're a grower, watch out during the day. This is when I think robberies will attempt because they know you're in there and that's where they're going to have access to the cash. So I think it's going to be imperative that we move forward. Be very, very careful about your, your security. Uh, again, what I'm going to do when I leave here today, I'm going to do my best to see if we can't change and make an amendment to this bill where we can put the signage up there minus the name. I think that's going to be a big issue for us right now. And uh, for what it's worth, there's a company out there for $1,000 a month at 1,000 linear feet. It's a 7,000 volt DC electric fence. It goes up 10 feet. I'm surrounding my building with that. I'll have signage out there. And I'm assuming just pull up the popcorn and the Coca-Cola and watch your video camera because they're going to start hitting that building, trying to get through that fence, and you're going to have a show going on. So um, anyway, I think that's going to happen. When we put that signage up there, I think a lot of people are going to start hitting our facilities. So anyway, that's, that's enough. So thank you, guys. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Next up is Beatrice Reyna. Um, <clears throat> a little short. So just to add on, it, my concern was about legislation, and um, it's been addressed multiple times, so I know that um, it's not in your control, but... I wanted to know if there was collaboration between OMA and the state legislations. Um, and, you know, just to let everyone know, I think the solution here is to run for state office. I mean, it's, I, I, don't, I don't know how else to address it, but I think coming together as a community um, and addressing, you know, the sign was my biggest concern, um, so. Anyway, thanks. Thank you. I like your outfit, and um, you should run for office. And I think that uh, it, obviously the people in this room um, 
have a, a cohesive message and Tom is on the right track that even right after this, just calling and letting them know, them know your concerns is a, a, can make a big difference. So good plan. Next up is Latoya Hill. Next. All right, next up is Donna Fagan. Uh, so I guess, uh, thank you for having us. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I guess my question is, is about agency accountability. Um, I know that you guys are a separate agency than the Bureau of Narcotics. Um, I have probably different circumstances than most people in, in um, with the agencies, but I have been two years licensed, two different licenses, never approval by the Bureau of Narcotics. Um, I'm up for renewal in February. I have had probably, I'd say, is it six? Six uh, inspections. I've had the Bureau of Narcotics in my front yard um, with guns in October. Um, never have I had any kind of um, what would you call it, like a citation, I'm non-operational, I don't have anything on my property, I report every month, I've never had a fine, um, and I can't get any kind of answers. So we are on the phone with them, what, probably every week, I would say, this is my paralegal here. Um, I'm just wondering how do I go about holding them accountable for taking my money year after year without any answers, Nobody's ever said you are not, we're not gonna license you. It's just pending, 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 you know? So how do you go about doing that, addressing those issues? <laughs> Big question. Um, <laughs> I guess is my question. Well, you know, you kind of hit, you asked a question that I have not thought about. So right. it, it did hit me a little uh, by surprise, because I don't have just an answer off the top of my head. Okay. Um, I did see you hand you handed your card, right, correct? Yeah. Okay. I have people that I'd like to confer with and see okay. if there's advice that we can give you. Because okay. off the top of my head, I'm not sure what, um, other than just um, figuring out what we can do to help you. And right. And, and I guess where out. my frustration level comes to, and this is obviously not directed at you guys because you guys come out, you're great. I've talked to multiple different inspectors. Uh, what is it? The compliance officers, the, um, if you're operating officers, everybody's heard my story. Everybody's been really great. Let me see what we can do. We don't see any, any red flags, no problems here, you know? Um, but what, I guess what frustrates me the most is it almost feels like extortion. You know, they take our money, they're putting our money towards, you know, whatever they're doing. There's, I see lots of resources going towards trying to find the grows that are actually not compliant. But then why aren't those resources going to remedying issues with people who are compliant, who are following the rules, you know? And, and they've come out to see that you're following the rules time and time and time again. So, yeah. Anyways, um, I heard the gentleman come up and speak and say that he had been waiting for at least four months from the Bureau of Narcotics, so it kind of struck a chord with me. Like, I'm not the only one, I'm sure. I'm sure there's lots of people that are going through this and maybe they aren't speaking up, but, you know, I just didn't know how we go about holding that agency accountable. I know they have a, their commission base. Every okay. agency is a little different, so they have a commission where I'm appointed directly by the governor, so if you want to hold me accountable, you talk to the governor and you make right. sure you let him know you're upset, upset with me, just FYI, everyone. Okay. Um, but they have a commission, so that's off the top of my head what I know. Okay, okay. And so there isn't anyone that, like, off the top of your head that's like, oh, okay, you, this is the chain of command for them? That's the only thing I can think of. Okay, yeah. all right. Thank you. All right, that's all of our signed up speakers. We do have time so we can take um, people that would like to speak. We had a hand over here and then we'll have over here this gentleman that I've never seen before. In the blue. I signed up earlier this Is your name Austin? Brandon. Oh, Brandon. I'm sorry. I got up at uh, 5.30 in the morning to take this chance to uh, speak with you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you. Uh, so uh, I'm vertically integrated. I've had a, my grow license since uh, 
May of 19. Uh, so my problem is, is I'm waiting for my application to be approved. And it, currently it's taking your agency 90 days to approve my license. <coughs> my license was sent in on October 7th and I renewed my OBNDD license on uh, November. The ownership list changed. I had to buy out my owners or the other partners. So essentially uh, I'm out my money that I had to pay for my other 50% of my business. I'm out the money that I had to pay for renewals. I'm out all the money I had to pay for harvest, all the money I had to pay for my uh, uh, crop, all the money for OBNDD, and come to find out that the ownership list is not the same as in o as what I had filed for ONB, ON, OBNDD, yes ma'am. And essentially what's going on is it's taking your agency 90 days to renew my license and in that time, I'm sitting here waiting for OB and DD to, to renew my license because the ownership is not the same. So they're waiting on your agency to tell them the ownership list has changed so that they can renew my license. But what's taken so long is your agency has taken 90 days to renew a license that's been current since 2019. Uh, nothing's changed besides the ownership list and I cannot get OMA to renew my license in a timely manner where I can get OB and DD to give me my license to where I can go sell my product. But currently, I don't have an OB and DD license and I'm not supposed to have product on my location. And I've had the largest harvest I've ever had in my life and I can't sell it because OB and DD will not give me the license to where I can take it to another dispensary and show them that I have the OB and DD license because the ownership list is not the same. Uh, and it's simply, I took, I bought out a 50% owner and they're waiting on the ownership list from OMA to match up with the ownership list that I filed for the new paperwork on November. Okay, I'm tracking. It took me a minute. Um, I mean, okay. So we do have 90 days. We did have a rush on applications. But it's never You're, taken 90 days before. Right. This is my fourth year to renew, and it's essentially, I've had renewals in the time frame of 30 days to 40 days, and now uh, and now it's taking in 90 days. And I yeah. don't know what kind of business can operate knowing that I, I don't get an answer for 90 days. I messed up on one thing. A gentleman said that uh, when you mess up on the license, it does not send you back what you messed up on. It takes it away. So you cannot see what yeah. you sent. So I cannot see that I, so you sent me back my license. Uh, I messed up on one thing, my good standing, which is a $20 fee to the state. I cannot see what I sent in. Okay. I don't know if it was the receipt or if it was the actual certificate, but essentially they kicked my license back January. And now I'm going to wait another 90 days for them to renew this license so that OB and DD can give me my license. That's 180 days that I've waited to sell a product. Okay. So that is something, okay, I'm tracking. The, I'm, I think the software issue of why the document's not in there, we, we will take that back and discuss and figure out why. Accountable. Yes, we will figure out what why that's happening. Like me that has no recourse. The 90 days situation though, I mean, that's just, I mean, that's a necessity and that's actually quicker than most industries get licensed. So we're going to make sure we do have it's enough got, staff to, to do a turnaround. There's 30% less license than there was a year and a half ago. But we're doing far more uh, three times longer. deep dives into our licensing. It's a renewal fee that I've had since four years. But we, we will look into Nothing's and changed. make sure that we born and, born and look into your We will Nothing's make changed. sure that we, you, thank you. Thank you, thank Brandon. You. We will look into it. You'll need to be on the microphone, please. Sure. Is it on? Yeah. So I spoke with the Bureau of Narcotics two days ago about this very issue um, regarding the renewal t process and an ownership change. They are waiting, and they said that they receive at a minimum of once every two weeks reports from OMA 
regarding ownership changes. They will not register or even renew if they're ha until they receive that report. So when OMA's not reporting to them, they are at a standstill. They are promising five weeks, but not until they receive the information from OMA. So I just heard that, okay? Guys, I'm the reason it's gotten worse. <laughs> I will tell you that right now. When I, look, the first year, every, every single license application, I mean, it was like they were going out the door quickly, okay? We're slowing down. We're making sure everything is done properly. We are making sure that every single thing is done properly. We are making sure everything is done properly. And that's what I can promise you. If you guys want us to make sure that they only the good actors are in the industry, it starts with licensure, okay? And it ends with compliance inspections. You can't pick and choose. So we are going to do our job and we're gonna do it well. That's not in our regulatory authority. So you. Actually, the min, most of them that have been busted this year have been licensed by us, so factually. Thanks, really. Um, I know that this process, you guys have excellent processes, and I, and I appreciate that, like, when we go through the application process, there's a review for all owners to look at and go, hey, what document did I upload? So I appreciate you guys doing that, right? It's a, we, we, we do take ownership, and sometimes we, we choose to point fingers at others, and there's an ownership that we need to take the time to look through our application, because I've been in this 2018, I think I've been rejected three times I take the time to review things to make sure that they're uploaded correctly. And so I appreciate you for having those things and <clears throat> what you guys do. Um, just some housekeeping things, the duplication of work. Um, when you guys do uh, the checklist revisions, unless I keep the previous revision, I don't know what changed. So like the latest one on the, on the growers is revision 3.1. And what changes are made to that revision? It would be helpful, like at the top says, hey, we revised question seven, this, so I don't have to take the time to read through all of it because now I can't see what revision 2.1 was to 3.1, little housekeeping thing. Um, <clears throat> the retention of COAs, since we are on metric now, and I know it's a time period of seven years, um, can we add some verbiage to that that says, hey, if you're on met, from this point forward, we don't have to keep paper version of that because it's all accessible in metric. <clears throat> but it doesn't say that on the checklist. It says seven years, right? And I know metric wasn't implemented when we started in 2018. So for some people that started in 2018, I understand that, that verb is. But if we can add something to say after that one, implementation of metric, we don't have to keep a paper version of it. <clears throat> and then um, the sample field log. So it's question 14. I believe, um, we're duplicating that work, right? Sample field log from a grower saying that I have to go in there and provide an Excel sheet or some other form that says where I sent it, how much I sent it, metric is providing almost 80% of that. Some of it's not on there, like temperature of, temperature of, of sample, the look of the sample. We either can add that to metric but I see that duplication of work as 90% of the information that's on that sample, I'm duplicating. I'm just taking it directly from metrics and just typing it over again. So, yeah, that's it. And thank you again for everything you did. Okay, thank you. Noted, and I know Michelle is noting as well. Jed, did you have something? Go for it. And then the person we called the name, Austin, or did you come back? What was the last name, Gilbert? Austin Jones? Yes, and LaToya Hill. And you would like to speak? Okay, after Jed, then, then you. Uh, again, I'd just like to thank OMMA for all the work that's gone on the last year uh, under your directorship and you know doing, doing this. 
I want to just run a little bit of house cleaning. Uh, my name is Jed Green. I'm director of ORCA, Oklahoma's for Responsible Cannabis Action. You may see us on Facebook here and there. Uh, we're a, a nonprofit advocacy group that is dedicated to uh, uh, preserving what we have here. You will not see what we have here in any other state. When we look at the uh, grow license numbers, know that this is the absolute most diverse group of businesses in this country. Absolutely, this does not exist anywhere else. We're dedicated to preserving that. And that's what lights up those numbers. Um, quick comment on supply and demand. Yeah, we should definitely keep that conversation going forward. I think that a lot of folks need to understand that at the point this goes federally legal, that it looks a lot like what we saw with industrial hemp under the 2018 Farm Bill. Expect prices to crash further than what they are now. Prepare for it. That's what's going to happen, guys. So we can talk about that. We could also talk about how, uh, as an agricultural commodity, the government pays us not to plant some crops. Maybe that's a conversation that we should be having with our legislature. So the reality is, is as a plant, it will always be easy to oversupply this product, just like it is with wheat, just like it is with milk, other things like that. So that has to be kept in mind. The concept of, oh, we have too much supply is not a good reason to put Ma and Pops out of business. Uh, that said, um, on your data, as y'all are going through the data and you're looking at, you know, you say, okay, cool, so we've got data, we're gonna pop red flags on grows, you know, looking at wet weight. I would really, really encourage y'all to also, like, take more time learning how to grow. You know, because here's the thing, for example, I've got, uh, let's say I've got, uh, uh, let's say I've got plants indoor that I'm doing under DWC or hydroponically, okay? They're gonna have a certain weight, but you know, I spent the last three years, you know, before establishing this organization and I have no commercial license now, I was a boot farmer, okay? Agricultural, we lit it up with a cotton planter just like you would hemp. So I may go out there and harvest when I have not watered my plants in 10 days in order to mess with the actual cannabinoids that are created in the profile by doing so. And so what you see is a wet weight in one plant, even outdoor grow to outdoor grow, can vary greatly as to how much moisture is actually in that plant when it gets processed. My point is this, is that you're gonna catch all sorts of things in the data that may look like, hey, this is a red flag, but understand there's nuance there. There's gonna be some real nuance there, and I think there's gonna be a learning, a learning curve. I think it's cool that y'all got the data, but it's just, you know, just heads up, that data, you can't mow a lawn sitting here in Oklahoma City. You have to be out in the field to do it. Um, the uh, outdoor signage that folks have been talking about, and again, you know, y'all understand that there is a whole lot of this that we have to deal with at the legislature. We've been up there dealing with this for the last four years. Love to have more people helping out. You know, we were the number one group that was up there fighting the outdoor signage bill. I'd like to let everyone know that that is a violation of your due process rights. And we're not just going to hang out and wait for the, um, and Oma's hands are tied, okay? But we believe it's a violation of due process and we are going to be taking immediate action in the next couple of weeks to try to resolve that outside of the courtroom. The tiered license increase bill that passed it will absolutely, you know, raise your costs an immense degree, making you less competitive with the market, with the black market. Well, we're going to go and hit that too. We All need right. your help. So anyway, I'll stop. I have comments. Um, <laughs> thank you, Jed. <laughs> thank you, Jed. Um, uh, Jed uh, does talk with the legislature a lot. I will definitely... Um, confirm that and and knows how to do that and knows lots of folks at 23rd and Lincoln. Um, and believe it or not, we have experts on staff and no experts that can read data and know how to grow. So I want to I want to confirm for you guys that we are not um, just looking at data and going, wow, let's go shut people down. That's not what we do, okay? Just want to let you know that and uh, that, that would not be a... Um, good way to run a state government agency. We will never do that. The data alerts us. We dig deeper. That's what we do. But thank you for the advice. Or some might call it mansplaining, but I wouldn't do that. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you. Um, and good info on the outdoor signage. Thank you.
sir. Uh, thank you for giving me time. Um, I want to say that I am with you and I feel how we've been through the difficulty and I totally uh, support all of you guys. Um, I am going to speak on behalf of myself. I'm from Tree Lab Garden, located in uh, Harvard. Um, thank you for the hard work that you guys have with uh, the community and the state. Um, one thing though I want to, um, I'm not sure if this is the right time to say this, but um, if there is anything that you guys think you guys short of budget as for volunteer or donation from us, we, myself would be more than happy to help with that. Uh, to help with the uh, project like doing research or the impact of uh, our cannabis that impact our environment. I, I would I would be more than happy to help with that because um, my background knowledge is in agriculture. I have a master degree from Thailand, and now um, I doing cannabis because I love and my my knowledge, and I want to drive this business as a successful business. And I want at the same time I want to making sure that um, the impact on our environment is only few. Okay, and. Um, Adding to that, um, I want you, I'm not sure if this is right, but I want you guys to add more stuff to uh, cover all those work that needed, not just for inspection, but also for educate people that are doing business like myself okay. um, and uh, my fellow Hmong people. Some of them, they, they have the uh, uh, mindset of hardworking people, but they still lack of I would say um, understanding of the law. So this is something that I truly believe that we need more education and not just um, excuse, you know. Yeah, okay. that's, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. I do want to say we as a state agency can not accept a donation, but I would encourage you to look into working with um, some of the local uh, colleges and universities um, regarding that, that research path, or even look into getting a research license from OMA because the environmental impacts are so big uh, that that is needed for sure, the research is needed. Yeah. So thank you, um, and the education for growers um, definitely uh, definitely needed. Thank you so much for your comments. Yeah. Oh, and, 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 and what is your, do you mind telling your name again? I don't know that we call oh, your name. Uh, my name is Boon Kong. Okay. Yep, B-O-O-N-K-O-N-G. Um, one more thing though, I want to add to uh, the prior lady, that uh, one house, we grow in uh, same environment, same uh, fertilizer, same practice, but we have multiple strain. For myself, if you look into the metric system, in the grower house number three, I have like a four strain in there, but the two of them only have like a five or six plant. If I gonna go to, for the full compliant test that cost me for like, oh, too much. Yeah, thank you. Understood, thank you. There was someone, was Latoya? Oh, back there, you wanted to come? You, yes. You're not Latoya. Did Latoya show up or Austin Jones? Nope, but you. I'm Joanna Hamrick, I'm with Primal Cannabis. Um, these are more statements than questions. Um, we are going into the legislative session. Um, I'm fully aware that you guys have no impact on that. Um, and I do encourage everybody to um, join an organization and also you know, call your local legislators and reps and tell them how you feel um, that is not done in this industry and needs to be done more. But things that I thought would be brought up today um, with state question 820 around the corner is that I'm in hopes that when OMMA 
if it passes, is doing regulation on it. I would like it to be known, that at least for my company, we would like the only changes to be at the register and how much the ex how much tax is charged, whether they're a patient or um, an adult use consumer. Um, we don't want to be putting a tag on a plant saying that this this tag is for medical and that this plant is for adult use. So that's just something I want to throw out there. Also, um, <clears throat> I know that OBNDD has asked for um, additional funding for enforcement, which they need. Um, I know we have the badges coming, which was a OBNDD request, and I'm all for the badges. I'm all for any kind of enforcement to shut people down. Um, but we do have this um, budget with OMMA, and there's a large amount left over, and I know that it was written into 788 that that, that amount is split between the two places it goes to. But if we, everybody's complaining about metric, if we do look for another provider, um, we're looking at a multi-million dollar contract, um, metric is always going to win um, because they pass the cost on to us. So if we go down this road and we and we look for a badge vendor and and if you guys decide to look for somebody to replace metric and the funding for OBNDD enforcement, I would really like to see that come out of the money that's collected from the license fees and the excise taxes instead of being passed on to us. Um, I. I come from convenience stores, so I'm used to having to pay like for several fees. I mean, if you run a convenience store, you're dealing with ABLE commission, um, tax stamps for um, tobacco. Um, you know, you have multiple things you have to do, but but we're pretty um, tapped out as the industry. So for the new stuff coming up, I would really like to see that come out of those um, coffers if possible. Um, and um, just a quick plug, uh, me and Taras are board members for the Oklahoma Cannabis Industry Association, and we do have lobbyists. Um, so if you're a mom and pop and you don't have money for lawyers or lobbyists, uh, you can join an organization like ours and get your voice heard at the Capitol. I'm out of time, my bad. Um, I did have a quick question on Fresh Frozen. Um, I don't think it's fully explained in the rules on the testing weight for fresh frozen. And, and that's something that we would like clarified as our company, um, 50 pounds is what's stated. And it doesn't say if that's dry or wet. So I, I would like clarification on that. Okay. We will get you clarification on that. Uh, we're out of speakers. I'm going to pause real quick and let uh, a state official that's in the room introduce himself and speak. Can we, Lee, can you get him the microphone, please? And it's bad when you are looking at all of your staff to give you any kind of indication on a question and know they all have blank faces. Can you guys give me like anything? Morning. I'm Keith Bryan. I'm the state fire marshal, and so I just wanted to come here, and <laughs> come here today, and uh, see what the comments were. I think sessions like this are great because uh, everything that we have issues with with this industry generally stem from a lack of communication, lack of understanding. So, uh, if there's anything y'all need to hear from me? Questions you have? From our agency, I'm happy to answer them. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Correct. Probably. Let me throw it out there to you this way. The, the biggest challenge we have, okay, is what you just described. Because because of your the compliance process, okay, 
when you go down your checklist or whatever, it says in there that you have to meet all local building codes. Everybody following me? Okay. So if you're in a the corporate limits of a city, they usually have a code official in that city. Maybe a fire marshal, maybe a building code person. Okay. That's who you would go through because most grow operations are in a county. They're not situated in a city. They go to the county, as you did, and say, what are your requirements? And the county will usually say, we don't have any building requirements, and that's a true statement. What they don't tell you, and this is the biggest problem for us, is the state does have a minimum building code. So if you're not under a city's jurisdiction, and very few counties have jurisdiction over building code, then you are under the state's jurisdiction, and that's where the breakdown occurs because you're not told at the county level, go see the state fire marshal. We, Director Barry and I have <laughs> kind of worked on that the past couple of years, okay, and we're trying to make improvements in that communication so that you know. Because when the county lets you go, you think you're good to go. In fact, some of them even check that box and sign off on your compliance paperwork that you checked with the county. There are some counties that will give you a letter or whatever, a, a piece of paper saying, we don't have any building codes, but you might want to check with the state fire marshal. Well, I'm going to take the might out of there. You should check with us because it creates a problem for you. You, you build your facility no, thinking that you're doing it the right way, and, and it's all good intention. I'm not, there are very few people that are trying to slip by, okay? Very few. Most of you are trying to do it the right way. We understand that. But you're up and running, and you've built your building, and, there, and the way we get it is a neighboring property, maybe even a competitor, will make us aware. Hey, there's this facility going on out here, y'all or maybe a local fire chief or whatever that's concerned about what materials may be involved in that process will contact us and we'll go out there and take a look. You're up and running and guess what? Your building doesn't meet code, okay? Unless it's an immediately dangerous to life and health situation, we won't go in there and shut it down. We have to do that in very rare cases when there's something going on there that is immediately dangerous to somebody's life or health. We'll work with you on those deals. Submit plans, we'll review those plans, we'll issue a permit, we'll do the necessary inspections, and when you're through with that, you'll get a certificate of occupancy that I heard you mention earlier. If you had an issue with that, I'd like to hear about it. Okay, the gentleman right here uh, mentioned something about architects and so forth. There is an architecture board so if you think you're being gouged by an architect, you, you should probably go to the architecture board and make them aware of it. Sir. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, right. We got Nick up here from Oklahoma LP Gas. He can, you can answer any. Yeah. I'm going to repeat it in the mic really quickly. Oh, I'm um, sorry. Really, just to make sure. He's um, asking about uh, CO2 at Groves. Right. CO2 systems have to be permitted. It's a separate permit than the building permit. Okay? The installers, if they're reputable, know that. So, one, they should not install a CO2 system in a non permitted building. And that system itself has to be permitted. Um, Department of Labor is actually the one that's kind of over the CO2 people because they're using uh, compressed cylinders or comp uh, pressure vessels. And, th and they license that. But we inspect it. And those systems have to be, it, the plans have to be submitted to our office, again, if it's under our jurisdiction. Okay, so that's the, the most important thing. Make sure you know who has the jurisdiction over your facility. If somebody tells you that because you're out in the county in a rural area 
that no building codes apply to you or anything like that, that is not true. It's absolutely not true. And, and those systems, like you're talking about, uh, and other LP gas, and I guess Nick's here, he can address that, but uh, yeah, that all has to be permitted. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we work with LP gas really closely on things, so. Yeah, Nick, come on up. I didn't realize you were here. So we do have a representative from the Liquid Petroleum Gas Commission. I didn't even know that existed until I took this job. But they are another state agency that um, helps regulate the medical marijuana industry and the space of LP gas. So mostly processors, but sometimes you deal with grows who have CO2 on site, especially indoor, yeah, I mean, particularly indoor grows. So you may have met Nick if you um, have an indoor grow. So if you have any questions regarding LP Gas Commission or State Fire Marshal, please utilize these resources while they're right here in front of you. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. Good to be here. Is the CO2 permit going to be like the same as a restaurant would have to have for a CO2 permit? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of it depends on the amount, but most grows are over the amount that... Let's, let's, as a comparison, a convenience store that has a uh, soft drink machine usually is below. Restaurant that has soft drink machines and uses CO2, B below the total amount of CO2 that would trigger that permit requirement. But 100 pounds, yeah. So if you're over that, and most grow CO2 systems are well over that, they have to be permitted. Yes, sir. K tank. K tank. How many pounds are in K tank? We. That's not our, our enforcement side on that. Okay. As far as LP gas goes. Uh, We're recording this, so that's why you have to. Okay. Mind. Thank you. So as as far as what you're talking about on the processing side with us, we are counting what is in the actual tank itself in the system. So as far as you guys bringing in your butane, your butane propane mix. As far as that goes, we don't allow you guys to store that inside the building. So any processing that uses unodorized gas is permitted through us. Okay. Uh, but this is a grower meeting, and that's the only reason I'm asking it. Because growers typically just dispense the CO2 in the atmosphere, and they're not using any of the So as far as my agency, as far as CO2, we don't permit that. That's strictly through the state fire marshal's office. The only time we come in on the CO2, on the grow enhancement enrichment environment, is on the LP gas generators that are producing CO2. That's where we come into play. So what we're gonna look at is the plan for that system. And, and really what we're looking at is if it's regulated, if it's properly regulated, meaning it's regulating the amount in the atmosphere, if there's an alarm system that would pick up if that goes over that amount, those are the kind of things that we're going to look for and require in a CO2 system. Because we've seen a little bit of everything. We, we've actually seen people that crack the valve on the tank and shut the door and walk out. But, you know. <laughs> okay, so it's basically competent. Mm -hmm. But like I say, the, the, the reputable people that are installing those systems, they know they are required to have a permit. They're another, the building has to have a permit for them to install one. So if if that if you use those folks, uh, that that should take care of itself, in most cases. <laughs> Ma'am. For our industry, more so than others. We have so many levels of compliance that we ourselves sometimes find out on the backside of an inspection. So if your agency and your agency could contact with this agency to, you know, we have a commercial license checklist mm -hmm. that I'm an order person. So I go and order, which I found out yesterday was incorrect because I need my metric before my OBD, <laughs> OB and BB. Um, so, so if we can get a, even a link to the standards that we have to follow, because my county said, no, you don't have to do anything. Exactly. They signed everything on the sheet. Mm -hmm. So, 
So You're what she has here is the commercial right? licensee checklist and the third item down here, this is just new, okay? And this is one of the things that we've been working with OMMA with for a little bit now. And so it says, if you plan to have a building or structure, you will need a certificate of occupancy or final inspection report from the appropriate authority having jurisdiction, your city, county, or the state fire marshal. Prior to that, and even in the statute, it's, it's not as clear and specific as this statement. So again, this is an attempt to make sure. And I appreciate that. Yeah. But my county says I don't need it. You don't need it for the county. Right, right. But, but when my county... My, I understand when, that. When Oma says I have to get my compliance from my city county, and my county says all the boxes are checked, mm -hmm. and I've stamped every line, I, as an owner, think I've completed I, said thing. And that, so That's why I said I think everybody is doing it is well-intentioned. They've tried to do it the right way, and that's the breakdown, and that's the gap that we've... Maybe yeah. we can change the or to and so that we know as a business to just verify that we didn't need to stop at the place that told well, us we could stop some there. Some counties do it, and that, then he doesn't. his folks right. don't have to do it. And, and we've worked with the and County the Commissioners problem. Association to try to get them to make sure that they inform people the same thing. So we're trying to get the word out there. Um, I'll just let you, I mean, of the 11,000 licensed grows, and I don't even want to show a hands on this because I, because <laughs> it's still something we're working through. We've probably we believe by our count we've only permitted about twenty percent of them. So you see where we're at. We're catching up, <laughs> sir. So here's my question then, because my grow is in the middle of nowhere as well, mm -hmm. and they signed off on it. Uh, so they signed off on everything. So we are like, okay, we're good. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that some of these small counties, they just check off the boxes. So when you find out, when you come to her grow or my grow, and you're like, whoa, mm -hmm. we're not going to shut you down right now, but you got to fix this. Mm -hmm. Are those counties being fined by the state for not doing their job? No. Why? But we're going to get fined. I think they're they're position, I'm not going to speak for the counties, but I, I think their position would be, we don't have any building codes, therefore we, were, we gave you an appropriate or um, response to your inquiry or whatever. That, that, that we, but again, we, we've tried to talk to them and, and some of the counties are now making people aware that they don't have any building codes, but the state does, and that's who you need to go see. So, again, it's just a process of trying to improve that communication and that awareness. But I, I, I don't see where the state would have any ability to fine a county for not making them aware of that. Can then I, how can you fine us for doing what our county is telling us to do? Can I give you a big picture understanding of all this? It's a history, a little slight history. Well, it's, I it's understand a, that, but it, it makes no you sense. understand something I didn't even say yet? But I understand what you're saying. It makes no sense that our county is telling us that we're good. He comes in and says, hey, you got to fix this because you got to get your state. And we say, hey, our county told us mm -hmm. and signed off. Here it we day. turned it in. OMA approved our license mm -hmm. to be functional. But we can't find these county officials that are just doing what they're going to do. Go ahead. Well, it's because the county is, this is historically how it works. Rural counties want very, very limited, they don't want zoning rules. They don't want zoning laws. They want limited government, right? Because it's agriculture land. They don't want to put a lot of um, rules in place. So that's what they do. They're like, nope, we're not gonna put zoning in place. They want the state to do that. They want the state fire marshal to come in and LP gas to come in and, and be in charge of that. The two big counties, Oklahoma City and Tulsa County, they have their own fire marshals. Am I am I correct about that? Okay, yes. good. Whew. They they have enough funds and enough places that they do it themselves. But the, the real issue is that your rural county should say like, we don't have any zoning laws, but yeah, you need to go talk to the state fire marshal. That's what what needed yeah, to happen, but they it shouldn't for years for whatever. And, and reason. we've been trying to get that word out to them to please help us with that and do that. As she said, Oklahoma County, Tulsa County. They're their own authority having jurisdiction. Obviously, there may be one other or two other, three, okay, that, that have, and guess what? Uh, a lot of those counties are picking up on this that 
uh, the more of you that come to them and ask the questions that you just talked about, they're saying, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> there might be some funds to be had here as far as permitting. And the reason why more of them are not doing it, they just don't have the resources people-wise or whatever to, to, do, to do building code work and so forth. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, just my personal opinion to uh, limit the argument or uh, future misunderstand. Mm -hmm. Can you guys just put like a clear guideline or clear direct uh, information into the form so that we, uh, whenever we apply for, we just yeah. follow that instruction? Well, th this is recent, so we've, we've worked with OMMA mm -hmm. to get them to make it more specific for our purposes in their yeah, because, checklist. Um, to be honest, um, I am out of the city limit a little bit, and based on what I just been told, I don't think mine is compliant. So that's, but like you mentioned earlier, that is not my intention to do it. I, we we are we are doing I, for the good thing, and just because we don't know the information, so please please uh, add information to the okay. guideline and inform all the grower that this is what you guys need and. This is what we need to stay compliant. I, that, and well, that's what we've been working on. So that's a step in that direction. And we've, all, we've also had discussions with OMMA about possible language in statute that would make it more yeah, specific. Thank you. Thank so you. those things are being worked on. I thought somebody else had. We'll get to but I, I absolutely agree with you, sir. You bet. Um, I think it goes back to we talked about talking to our legislators but it's also a county issue. Your, your county commissioner meetings are open public meetings and I have attended my county commissioner's meetings because I was trying to get my certificate of compliance for renewal and uh, with COVID and everything, but uh, it's still, I had, I had turned in the form. I hired, I, I, I called the fire marshal in my area to come out before I ever started building. Mm -hmm. So I knew I was in compliance, but I had to have that, that form signed. And um, my county commissioners did not know anything. They questioned me for 30 minutes and I gave them answers that I had found by the discovery process of having to go through it. Mm -hmm. and. Their call, to, my call to my county was the first call I made. And they said, oh, you're outside of civil limits. No, there are no zone. And we knew we had to be in compliance with codes. And so then, you know, we called the state. And uh, I mean, educate them. You have to attend the meetings. You have to talk to them. Yeah. In fact, there's been at least a couple of counties that have adopted resolutions that said they wouldn't sign off on the compliance unless they saw a certificate of occupancy from the state fire marshal. So that, that's another way we've been trying to address it. Someone right here wants to speak. How about those situations where the city does provide a building permit? Because at that point of time, they did have the jurisdiction over mm -hmm. it, but then they lose jurisdiction and um, so that happened with one of the growers mm -hmm. where um, they had a building permit, city signed off, and mm -hmm. then they later received a letter from the city that they had lost jurisdiction to be able to provide those building permits. Okay, and, and I, I, I've seen those situations happen. Cities can adopt or uh, establish their own authority having jurisdiction for building codes. It, it requires a letter from that city to us uh, signed off by the building code official, a fire chief, uh, city manager, city attorney, something like that. Really what it is is an attestation that they will, at a minimum, follow the minimum state code. That's what they're telling us they'll do. Again, some of them have the ability to do that, some don't. Um, so therefore, sometimes when a city that did have jurisdiction all of a sudden doesn't want it anymore, they don't want to be involved in that anymore, they'll rescind that and it falls back on us. In those cases where something was permitted by the city, okay, we're going to 
unless we know otherwise or unless we see otherwise, we're going to believe that that was permitted at the minimum state code. And we're going to deal with it on that basis. So we're not, it would just depend. We'd probably go out there and look it over. And if we felt like we needed to go back through that review process and permitting process, it would just probably depend on what we see when we get there. But if we can, if we know that the permit was done according to code and that somebody looked at it, we'll probably just kind of pick it up from that point and go forward. Okay. Instead of making somebody reapply, and uh, probably depends a lot on the time frame too when it was originally permitted and so forth. So a lot of those factors go into it. But we try. I'm going to say this. I don't want to hear any snickers. Okay. We try to be very business friendly in our approach. We don't want to shut people down. Okay. And to us. Because I heard a comment ago that they thought another agency was giving them a hard time just because it was cannabis related. It doesn't matter to us, okay? We look at the property classification for a marijuana grow is a factory. We look at you at like a factory. So whether you're making dog food, whether you're cultivating and processing marijuana or some other product, that's what we go by in the code. And so... What you said applies to other b b businesses too, that they were originally permitted by a city. They're no longer under that city's jurisdiction or that city gave up its jurisdiction. We usually just pick it up from the point we get it. If the building still meets code, we're fine with it. Okay, we have a few more minutes and a few more questions, so if you could keep Maybe it bring up brief. I'm going to get to this gentleman, and then I'll get to you. Safety and plan and plan. The question specifically is, unless you're looking at a property, and it was built 20 years ago, mm -hmm. However, got built, no idea. Whoever built it, don't know. Mm -hmm. Assuming it did get permits, mm -hmm. whichever, it was pre cannabis. Mm -hmm. Do we have to go to your, uh, to Fire Marshal now and get that updated to be cannabis now? Yeah, any code. And I'll just tell you, in case y'all want to look at it, we're, our statute is Title 74, state statute. And it, it lays out our jurisdiction, where our jurisdiction begins and ends, and the things that we'll, we do and that we permit and so forth. Any change of occupancy. So let me give you a good example because we see this. There's a lot of people that go out and find an old school building in a county that's no longer a school. And because it has smaller rooms in it and so forth, and it's a good facility for them. Okay? Where it once, when originally permitted, was an educational facility under the code, now it's going to become that factory. So any change of occupancy requires a new permitting process and so forth. Any major remodel to an existing structure requires the permitting process to be gone through again. Um, and Nick brought up a good point. I want to bring it up real quick. Back to her question a little bit. Um, uh, a lot of cities that have jurisdiction previously just had it for fire and life safety inspections. They didn't do CO2 systems. They didn't do alarm systems. They didn't do sprinkler systems, which all require a separate permit. In the past year, since I've been in this position, we've changed that. Any city that wants jurisdiction has to do everything. They can't pick and choose anymore. You either do it all or not. And so a lot of them have given it back to us, and we've actually had some that even picked it up. But, again, again any... Um, back to her, the checklist that she had, it also it said certificate of occupancy or report of final inspection. So if it's an existing building that was once permitted, okay, and nothing major has been done to it or whatever, sometimes all we'll do is go out and inspect it. And, or the local person will go out and inspect it, and we get a report of that, then you, you, you're issued a permit or a certificate of well, occupancy. Well, that's my question. Do you have to get a plan review? Do you have to get architectural drawings and a whole bit? Any major remodel? No, but or, if, if there's no remodel, we just move in the building. But if it's a change of occupancy, I mean property classification, where it once maybe was, like I say, educational, or yeah. maybe it's an old church or whatever, if that building classification, you know, that property classification changes, has to go, go back through that process. Through the whole architecture.
architectural drawing plan review the whole. Yeah, but I mean the architecture. If it if the building's not major remodeled or whatever, I mean you might get by with just letters from an architect saying this building still meets code and it hasn't been structurally changed but in a real significantly. World, you hire an architect thousands so of dollars. So I'm gonna so. just ask you two to take this offline okay. and. Uh, Fire Marshal Bryant, if you are not opposed, do you mind just sticking around for oh, sure. a few minutes after and the same? Sure. Um, Nick, okay. Um, we only have a few more minutes, and I would really like to give the floor to uh, Lee Rhodes for a few moments, if you don't mind, Lee, just for a few closing comments, and Michelle for a few closing comments, and I think Adam Rogers. Uh, we have 10 more minutes, and I'd like for them to just kind of wrap up for us as we close up our Grow Town Hall, and then um, we will look forward to seeing you guys at more events this year in 2023 as we move forward. We will be sending out responses to many of these things that need to be um, wrapped up and, cl and closed up and need answers, so you will hear from us. Lee? Thank you, Adria. Um, just really quickly, uh, to be honest, I was expecting a lot more from this group about labs and uh, testing. Um, so hopefully maybe I can uh, just color in the, the picture for you just a little bit. Uh, we certainly recognize that, that um, labs can hold up and, and, and create problems for every commercial enterprise uh, in this industry. Uh, we're, we're very much aware of that and the problems that, that exist um, here in the state. Uh, for what it's worth, we're not unique in that. Uh, every state seems to be struggling with the same thing. Uh, a little bit about my background. Um, I'm going on my 40th year in laboratory operations, uh, from the bench level all the way to administrative work um, uh, over very large uh, testing companies, reference laboratories, uh, I was a clinical pathology manager for uh, the second largest uh, reference laboratory company in the country. I've also been over very large hospital laboratories. Um, and for the most part, when you go and have a, a, a lab work done by your physician, you don't really question it. And that's because there's an awful lot of rigor that goes into that laboratory operation. Um, my goal is to bring that same level of rigor to cannabis testing. And we're making progress. Uh, it's, uh, I'd be the first to, to admit, I wish we were farther along. Um, uh, I characterized it yesterday, that sometimes it's like pushing a rope uphill. Uh, but we are making progress, and I've got a very strong team now of, uh, of inspectors. Our process, in, as was on the slide earlier, we don't just go in and say, show us your paperwork. Uh, we don't leave it up to the fact that somebody has ISO accreditation. That can be a piece of paper on the wall that you got at one point, then you quit thinking about everything you had to do to get that. We will go to the bench level. We'll start at a COA, look at those results, and go all the way back to what did your instrument actually say was there or not there. And we'll do our own math. That process takes a very long time, but it's, it's yielding results. Um, we're getting a reputation among the laboratories as um, in some cases, uh, we are appreciated. Uh, they'll say we're very thorough. In other cases, we're being heavy-handed. But the reason why we're being heavy-handed is for the quality of the product and the safety of the people who consume the products that you all manufacture. Uh, we also are uh, have embarked upon a standardization process and. Uh, Luckily, lab, no matter what kind of lab test it is, uh, you know, whether it's a flu test, uh, your COVID test you can do at home, things have to be done in a certain order. So it lends itself to, to evaluating 
and finding out where that process could have gone wrong. And that's the approach we're taking in the standardization, uh, the last portion of which we're looking at each analyte category, pesticides, heavy metals, uh, cannabinoid uh, concentration. Uh, and then we're going to put a, a very thorough um, quality assurance regimen that goes on there that just really basically is going to overshadow anything you have to do to get your ISO accreditation. And um, the timeline on that is that we have to have those designated, de decided by June 1st, and then OMA has 90 days to, to promulgate emergency rules for that. So this is not going to be a long, drawn-out process in getting those standards in place. And we're going to focus on things like your method has to have a potent, uh, excuse me, accuracy of X and a precision of Y. And you have to demonstrate that through your quality control process that you achieve that day in and day out. And those will be the things that we will go in and review. And again, we won't just take for granted what you have on your paper. We're going to go look at your instrument, see if it really said, did what you said it did. Uh, so um, change is coming. It's, okay. it's, uh, it's sometimes agonizingly slow, but I wanted to reassure you all that we know what the issue is and uh, we have a plan to address it. Thank you, Lee. We are going to pass a mic to Michelle quickly and Adam. Good morning, good morning. Um, I'm Michelle Reddish, um, Chief Regulatory Officer with OMMA over the Compliance Department. And it's always a pleasure to learn more about the industry and areas that we can help. What I heard today um, that I will take back to my team, excuse me, is that we will work on documentation and records, review those documents to make sure that they're up to speed and where they need to be so that you all have all the information available to you all um, in, in support of your compliance efforts. Metric, uh, I know metric um, <laughs> there are areas with metric that we are going to work on. As metric evolves within OMA, we are going to hold them accountable the same way we are working to hold our licensing system accountable. So we hear you and we're working within our group to make sure that um, our um, working groups evolve to, in, uh, to make sure that we hold metric accountable and build the system to be able to support our regulatory needs. And then last but not least, uh, we're going to partner with our information and technology department within OMA to um, ensure that we get that um, support, that external um, NCS analytics um, training. So we hear you. We're going to work on it. I'm excited. And we're going to turn these opportunities um, into um, improvements for you all in the industry. So thank you. Yes, awesome. Thank you, Michelle. Adam. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, Hello, everyone. My name is Adam Rogers. I'm the director of licensing. I've been with OMA since November of 2019. So I've kind of been through a lot of this with you guys, and I've seen a lot of the changes that you guys have encountered. Uh, I know that the processing times are slower right now. I will tell you that we received a little over 2,600 new applications, all within about 30 days of the moratorium. Uh, so that is a big reason why it's taking longer. Um, we're aware and we're doing things to try and move people around to keep up with the demand. Uh, the good news is we're almost through all of them. Uh, so you should see those processing times decrease very soon. Uh, we're also doing some increased training with our staff, uh, primarily the commercial staff, to get through the applications a little bit more thorough uh, and to kind of help with any inconsistent rejection reasons that you guys receive. Um, I'll be here for a little while. If you have any other questions or anything, I'll be happy to talk with you and visit with you. Uh, other than that, thank you guys for coming and sharing your concerns and your uh, pain points with us. It's, it's very enlightening. I've got about four pages of notes now uh, to kind of help make this better for everybody. So thank you. Yes, that's the goal they're taking back. Uh, there will be action items. This is not for nothing, okay? That's what I want to assure you all. This is f uh, for us to take back the knowledge, this new information that we have on what is 
is affecting you guys in the industry. Um, when you do talk to the staff at OMA, please be kind. Uh, if you are not kind to them, you will deal with me and you don't want to deal with me, okay? Um, so I want to make sure that you know how hard they work every day and they do it because they love this job, they care about OMA, and they want to see it succeed. They wouldn't keep coming back if they didn't. It's not an easy job. I'm not an easy boss, okay? So please be kind to them. Now, as you leave, um, if you want a follow-up and you have a specific question, please make sure uh, Gilbert has that info. And thank you for being here. We have the processor town hall this afternoon. See you guys. Have a fantastic rest of your day.